Super Show, the one that no one else would dare to do. In three, two, one. I'm just assuming that some other podcast somewhere that we don't know about has already done this. You know what I mean? Nope, not possible. They're going to be like, we're not going to listen to your show because we already done it. I told David Ladd we were doing it. I said, what do you know about F.S.F. Brown Rig? And he said, not much. And I said, well... Might be some SF Brown Rig talk in the future. Yep. He said he, he, not too long ago, he watched Poor White Trash too. Nice. And I said, well, we're doing, we're doing his four films. And he immediately said, Super Show? Is this a Super Show? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, it is. He said, whoa. Very exciting. Oh, man. I don't know. I think it could be 4.5 films. Could be. Could be. Thinking big, everybody. Thinking big. <laughs> We are also thinking big. Yeah, that's the whole mantra of Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone. <laughs> Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone? I am Richard. I'm Brad. <laughs> okay, folks, it's, it's Hello, This is the Doom Show, but like my band Gyro Jets, we have a secret name, which I'll out here. It's called Jarge. 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 And so I was like, dude. Brad, we should have a secret name for the show that we should tell everybody about. And after a few moments of, of back and forthness, you came up with Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> I'd call it a classic, but what's the point? Everyone knows. I told you I should have just gone back to bed after I said that because nothing was going to top that. <laughs> it still hasn't. Nope. We're still waiting. Still waiting. <laughs> so, yes, we are talking about SF Brown Rig. Um, we've been coming up with many names for him. I think, uh, my most recent was Stupid Fernando Brown Ripple. Mm-hmm. That's one of my favorites. Thank you. Sanguine Frack, Frack Brown Bag? <laughs> <laughs> frack Frack? I guess that'd be S-F-F Brown Rig. His name was actually Sherald. S-H-E-R-A-L-D. Yes, what is his middle name? I, it's not on the internet. Oh, I found it. Okay. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, so S.F. Brownrigg, uh, a director born in uh, El Dorado, Arkansas, and mm -hmm. uh, he was a combat photographer who became a sound guy after the war and then eventually became a director and did some very uh, similar films uh -huh. with uh, a troupe. He had a troupe that he used. The S.F. Brownrigg players, if you will. Exactly. And uh, he, he's... Just somebody I find really fascinating. Absolutely. Very glad you were uh, excited to talk about his movies with me in this mm. super show. But I did a little extra research on the VCI DVD, the double disker, with uh, Don't Open the Door, which we'll be covering later, and uh, Don't Look in the Basement. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, Don't Open the Door should be called Don't Answer the Phone, but we'll get to that. And on this disc, uh, there's a SF Brown Rig bio. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it's like, God, it's like five or six pages long. You know, like, it's just the screen freezes, there's text, mm -hmm. then it fades out and then fades in and there's text and uh, no music, just, just the, the sound of the inside of my brain. And uh, it's Fergus. Seriously. Cheryl Fergus Brown Rig. His parents hated him. <laughs> well, it was El Dorado. Well, that's They're true. like, you'll never leave here. No one leaves El Dorado. My wife, my wife just walked in. The oh, door. hello, Jello, Jello, who moved the tombstone? <laughs> <laughs> Did she turn right back around and leave? Yeah, she's gone now. <laughs> probably, probably forever. Oh, brother, I'm sorry. Oh well, I still got you. You right? still got me. I won't leave you. I, I mean, I'm sweating and I'm shouting, but that, that's, that's all you need to know about SF Brown Rig movies. Yes. Um, I had the order mixed up and I was all excited to, to talk about Poor White Trash 2 first. 
uh, well, I guess it's more of a casual excitement. Uh, and then all of a sudden I noticed the order of the film. So we're going to start with his debut feature, Don't Look in the Basement. Probably his most famous. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, pff, shit. Is anyone listening not have a copy? I doubt it. I bet everyone's got a copy of this. Oh my god. Okay, so before we start, I have IMDb open. At the top of the screen, because I've scrolled down, is Spider-Man's crotch. It's really right. distracting. <laughs> Thank god it's not a video podcast, because no one would be looking into my eyes. They'd be looking right at my spider crotch. Oh wow. Of course, there is an amazing trailer for Don't Look in the Basement. Uh, one of the things that's a recurring theme in uh, this gentleman's work is that every movie he ever made was retitled. Every one of them. And I'm just assuming he was cool with this because it happened every time? Yeah. He would make things that were tailor-made for the uh, drive-in circuit for the pre-Grindhouse kind of era, or maybe just Grindhouse era. Mm -hmm. Don't Look in the Basement, its original title was The Forgotten. It also had another title... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it had a perfectly uh, apt alternate title that would describe, hello, this is the Doom Shore. Doom Shore? Sure. Oh, I just saw Dinah Shore on an episode of Murder, She Wrote that Lieta's watching, so I got Shore on the brain. Mmm. Yeah. The title is Beyond Help. Really? And that's just describing us. Mm-hmm. It was also True. called The Snake Pit and Death Ward number 13. See, that's what I thought you were going to say. I was oh, trying to man. think, how does Death Ward 13 relate to us? <laughs> How doesn't it? I mean, really? Well, yeah, well we're more right. Death Ward 9. Yeah, 8.5. So, uh, this film uh, was piggybacking, uh, for better or for worse, I'd say some folks would say for better, I would say mm, undecided, uh, piggybacked onto Last House on the Left, directed by good old Wes Craven. Right. And so, when you look up uh, this trailer and watch it, you'll see lots of clips from Last House on the Left mixed with... Don't look in the basement. And, of course, that famous, famous drive-in bullshit. Just keep repeating. It's only a movie. It's only a movie. It's only a movie. Oh, my God. It's so cheesy. But it, it's great because they yeah. kept reusing it over and over again. <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> like, if you if you don't know it's a movie, you've got other problems. <laughs> they wheeled you in. <laughs> I'll just stop that. That. <laughs> but I was about to go down a really dark path there. Uh, so here is the trailer. D uh, don't worry, it's only a trailer. <laughs> Ooh, nice. <laughs> I just threw up on myself, but only in my mind. Don't. Don't look in the basement. The makers of Last House on the Left warn you again. <laughs> to avoid fainting, keep repeating. It's only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. The line between sanity and madness can be crossed in a single step. And with this step, you enter the nightmare world of terror. Judge Cayman, whose iron self-control hides the urge to kill. Harriet, a mother's love, twisted into the malignant shape of evil. The sergeant, living in the hell of an aimless war, fighting a battle within himself that he lost long ago. Allison, in a desperate need for love, an obsession that could drive her to murder. Danny whose sense of humor triggers a violent act of revenge. Dr. Masters, who has her own idea of the gentle art of healing. And Charlotte, who left the world of sanity and security only to be trapped in the nightmare world of madness, a nightmare she cannot escape. They all met on the day the insane took over the asylum. Don't look in the basement. From Hallmark Releasing Corporation, rated R. It took me a little while to track this down because there's no uh, information on the VHS releases for this film on IMDb. Usually there's like four or five 
Uh, but this goes right from the uh, theatrical distribution and goes straight into the uh, DVD, which this has been on DVD. Uh, how many times, Brad? Mm, uh, current date, there are 213 different releases, I think. Death Ward, 213 DVDs. So I did find a VHS. Uh, well, I found many, but this one's pretty sweet. From Vid America, that's one word, uh, mm-hmm. Incorporated, New York, New York, uh, that says, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest Meets Night of the Living Dead. Uh, that's a quote from Slaughterhouse Magazine. Did they see it? <laughs> Wait a minute. Slaughterhouse. I'm, I think I'm going to get a trade magazine for, uh, for, uh, for butchers. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Slaughterhouse Magazine. Ooh, the covers are sweet. Ooh, I want to track some issues of that down. That looks fucking awesome. Anyway, so Slaughterhouse Magazine does in- indeed exist. Uh, it says here, before Halloween, before Friday the 13th, before Nightmare on Elm Street, there was Don't Look in the Basement. The very first in the famous Don't series of horror noia films. Uh, it, the only way that could be better is if it was horny Oreo, yeah. Like it was a horny film. Mm hmm. Yes. There's gonna be some horny in this movie. A lot of horny. And the plot says. Can you imagine life with the most demented of the criminally insane? Explore the darkest, most hideous side of human nature as you travel through the twisted corridors of an asylum where the inmates are in charge, spoiler, and hell-bent on murder. 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 So there you go. There's there's some fun VHS nests. Uh, there's a tagline in this. Oh, I got like five. Okay. <laughs> the day the insane... Took over the asylum. Spoiler. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. It's like, it's the oldest trope in the book, but still. <laughs> you know? Not come everyone on. has seen every movie, idiots. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but by the way, spoiler alert. You make it over the shock, but you will never forget, dot, 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 the forgotten. Well, if we won't, then how is it forgotten, geniuses? Forget what? If you'll never forget it, then why do they call it the forgotten? Because it is forgotten. Forget if what? That's true. What are we? What? Uh huh. See? See what I did there? Yeah. Boom. <laughs> to avoid fainting, repeat. It's only in the movie. It's only in the movie. It's only in the movie. Okay. Here's my favorite. This is the best thing ever. And we are we are now out, dude. We are now done. We can't even talk about this now. Okay. Not recommended for persons over thirty. <laughs> 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 Well, thanks for listening, folks. <laughs> I'm only about 10 years shy of 30. Or no, yeah. wait, shy is, that made me 20. Never mind. I, I'm um, less mature than a 20-year-old, so I have that in common with them. Well, yeah. Who's them? I don't know. Uh, here comes, they lived out their fantasies, dot, dot, dot. Now they are dying for them. Mm. 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 <laughs> That's how I feel about that one, too. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's go ahead. We're going to keep this pretty loose. Uh, we got a lot of movies to cover on this episode, so we're going to keep it a little fun. We'll keep it as necrofeel me as possible. Mm-hmm. Brother, can you necrofeel me? I'm necrofeeling you. <laughs> I like it when you say it. So it takes right. away my uh, responsibility. Right. I just pass that necrofeel right to you. Mm. I'm taking it. This jumps right in with the lunacy. Uh and I don't mean a full moon. Uh, I mean crazy people. Uh, this is an asylum in, I believe it's called Tehuacana, Texas. It is indeed. I love that. You haven't been there, have you? You know, I haven't. It's up. It's uh, it's kind of in northeastern Texas a little bit. Mm-hmm. So no, no, I don't think I've been through there. All right. Well, you survived. So obviously you had not. Right. It's a dangerous place. Uh, when it jumps right in, we got two characters uh, hanging out. We got Sam, who's played by Bill McGee, a very, very tall uh, black dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, instantly lovable character. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, when your your purpose in life is to eat popsicles, I mean, there you go. Yeah, I like it. Now, this actor uh, is only in a few things, uh, but nothing I really recognize. You know, in a thriller called Shadows on the Wall. 
1986. Looks pretty neat, or at least sounds interesting. Uh, let's see, and uh, Sarge is the other character here. Hugh Feagan, that's the actor, playing Sergeant Jaffe, which I find very amusing. Very. And um, this guy is one of the uh, regular players with the SF Brown Rig. He was also in the movie we're talking about right after this, um, called Scum of the Earth. Wait a minute, this is getting confusing. Okay, I'm looking at I'm looking at the order of movies again. So they don't know when Scum of the Earth, a.k.a. Poor White Trash 2, was released. It says July, but it doesn't say when it came out officially, officially. So now it looks like after Don't Look in the Basement, then they're saying Don't Open the Door is next. But we're not doing that. Uh, Wikipedia's got Don't Look in the Basement 73, Poor White Trash 2, 74, Don't Open the Door 75. And then apparently he took 1976 off, probably because he's very patriotic. Hell yeah, America. That's right. And then the following year made Keep My Grave Open. Ah, okay. So thank you, Wikipedia. Hope you're right. It's never been wrong before. Never. Uh, Sam uh, will find out later that he had a lobotomy, and that's why he is no longer this rage-filled uh, angry man. He's now just a, a giant man with the brain of a child. Which makes makes me think of a Dr. Katz episode where someone said, baby shoe good, baby boot wrong. Mm, that's true words have never been spoken. <laughs> Dr. Katz fans will understand. Uh, and then Sarge, of course, is a, is a Vietnam veteran who's been traumatized by the war. Which war would you think it would be? I'm going to say Vietnamans. Viet- Vietnam, the Nam. The Nam. Maybe he was just reading the uh, the Marvel comic. The Nam. The Nam, which is, um, I never read that. No, no, I wasn't into, into war comics whatsoever. Uh, so let's meet the rest of our gang. We've got, so we've introduced our, our, our sergeant, who's, of course, obsessed with being in the military. Uh, then we meet Harriet, and uh, she's a real baby lover, because she has, <laughs> <laughs> she has a doll. Uh, hard-hearted harbinger of haggis. <laughs> Bellicose. Oh my Bugged. god! Yeah, I'll stop. This is this is Camilla Carr who plays Harriet. Um, she will be in two more movies in this episode. I'm very, I'm very excited to say I'm I really really like this this actress quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's good. Spoiler alert: she's also in Don't Look in the Basement Two, the sequel to this movie. Really? Directed by S. F. Brownrig's son, Anthony Brownrig. F. S. Brownrig. <laughs> F. S. Fergus. Sanford and Sons Brown Ring. <laughs> I didn't even think of the Sanford and Sons connection. Sons? There's more than one son all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, she's super attached to her uh, her dolly. She thinks it's a real baby, which is fine, because uh, it'll never grow up and hurt her. Never. Not the way we shamed our parents. <laughs> Continue to shame them right now. Yeah, exactly. Man. What do you, what do you mean, stopped? <laughs> what do you mean, Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone? <laughs> Another character that we meet is uh, another inmate of this asylum, this uh, rather laid-back asylum, as we'll get to know. We're talking about Judge, and uh, this sexy son of a bitch Mm. is played by... Preach it! Preach it, brother. Played by (laughs) Gene Ross. Uh, Gene Ross, a regular SF brown rig guy. Also a a very steadily working actor up until uh, 1999, when I guess he retired. Oh, jeez. Showed up in a Murder, She Wrote episode. Hell yeah. Or of course he did. So, let's see. This guy. Uh, let me keep, wow, I have to scroll through a lot here. Do-do-do-do. Ooh, he was in Encounter with the Unknown. Speaking of mm. weird little movies. Uh, isn't our um, our main character, uh, Nurse Charlotte, isn't she also in Encounter with the Unknown? Let me see. That's Rosie Holotick. Uh-huh. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, I don't think she is. I don't see her. Really? I could have sworn. Yeah, it's a whole huge cast in Encounters with the Unknown. And I don't see her name. She's in four things, and three of them were the same year. She's in Don't Look in the Basement, Encounter with the Unknown, Horror High, and then in 1991, she was in a Perry Mason TV movie. Oh, my God. I keep scrolling, and I don't see her. This is so weird. She plays Suzanne. There it is. Ugh. You, I, I figured you were right, but I just couldn't find it. There's only 900 people in that movie. Well, that's true. I've not seen it. Is it good? It's really, 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 really offbeat. 
really. I think it would be fun to watch with this as a double feature. That same year, she's also in Horror High, which I've not seen. What is Horror High? Somebody gave me a copy of that. Who was it? That's not the one with the kid. <gasps> I have actually seen Horror High as well. Maybe you're the one with Austin Stoker. Yes, a nerdy high school super whiz experiments with a chemical that will transform his guinea pig, Mr. Mumps, from a gentle pet into a ravenous monster. I got that, um, it was the Horrible Horrors DVD set, Mm -hmm. and uh, it was that, and I'm not going to get up and go get it, but it it was pretty sweet. It was that Horrible Horrors DVD collection. This was one of my first, like, horror collections I bought. You know, I swear somebody sent me a copy of that, and I was thinking it was you, but maybe not. It's got Horror High, Satan's Slave. Oh, my gosh. Norman J. Warren into Hizzy. Yes. Uh, Point of Terror, which is the movie I was trying to think of. It's hilarious. Yeah, that one recently got a Blu-ray release. <laughs> I remember Scott reviewed him. Oh, my God. It's so funny. He he was messaging me like, this is crazy! <laughs> and then uh, another Norman J. Warren movie, Terror, which we love. Man, that's a solid set. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, Roberta Findlay has two movies on here, Prime Evil and Lurkers. Not seen either. Something called Fleshburn, which is the only one I've never watched in that set. And, of course, The Hearse. Oh, snap. <laughs> I have quite a history of that movie. Yeah, you do. Mm, moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> Tangents. Man, what the fuck were we talking about? Oh, yeah, Gene Ross. Uh, Gene Ross, uh, he's also, we're going to see him later and Keep My Grave Open, and uh, Don't Open the Door, and Poor White Trash 2, a.k.a. Scum of the Earth. Mm. I'm just checking to see if he came back for a thinking big, but I don't see it, so. <laughs> but I do see him in frickin' Halloween 4. No way, really? Yeah, oh man, time to rewatch that. Oh, I know what, uh, he's one of the rednecks, isn't he? Uh, well, his name is Earl, so yes. Yes. <laughs> He's on the truck with a shotgun. Oh, shit, dude. Oh, Gene Ross is my hero. <laughs> He's pretty darn good. Yeah. He's, he's uh... His face is, um... It's, okay, so when you watch these movies, there's lots of sweating, as I mentioned. There's right. lots of shouting, which I think I also mentioned. But there's mm-hmm. also lots of close-ups... Very much. And if you just think about seeing this in a drive-in, like, his face just on the giant screen would be (laughs) quite a sight. (laughs) Yes. Tell us, tell us what you texted me about your game, your drinking game. Okay. I made a drinking game for the films of SF Brown Rig. Uh, The first rule is, uh, whenever someone is sweating, you take a drink. And the second rule is, whenever you hear someone shouting, uh, you take a drink. And the third rule is, Go to the hospital. <laughs> You're gonna die. <laughs> You're gonna die. And you know what? I, you know, after you said that, I'm like, holy crap, you would die. <laughs> uh, I mean, like these would almost fall into the category that we love on this show called quiet horror. <laughs> but people are yelling too much. People, people are yelling. Uh, so the judge, um, his thing is that he uh, is a prosecutor. Oh, excuse me. Um, he's a judge of the, the circuit court or whatever. He has a spiel he gives out every time. It, it's it's hinted that he was unlawfully sending people to jail or something. And that's what drove him crazy. That's what I get from this mm-hmm. thing here. Oh, like Sarge. Um, Sarge, the army guy, he caused his whole platoon to get killed. <laughs> yeah. Poor guy. Oh, SF Brown Reagan is secret anti-establishment little things here. Mm. They're not secret. No. Um, we got another patient here named Allison. Allison is, of course, my favorite. Why is she my favorite, Brad? She's a sex fiend. Yes! <laughs> She's a sex fiend. That, mm-hmm. is, like, oh, I, this actress is named Betty Chandler, and she never went on to do anything else. And that's okay. She got it all out here. Right. She did all of her, you know, her entire career in one film. Very fun. <laughs> Very fun. Um, she wears like uh, a pound and a half of uh, makeup and just tries to seduce everybody. It's great. If this was an Italian film at this time, she would also be seducing uh, our main character. Mm-hmm. Because she's a lady. Uh, then there's the quiet one. Uh, is it Jennifer? Uh, yes. Uh, according to Wikipedia, emotionally dependent. Aw. 
She played a sales lady on Rhoda. <laughs> right. Nice. I love it. I ought to buy something from her. There you go. Hell yeah, dude. Just as long as it's not anything sharp. Right. Because, of course, this withdrawn character will lash out later, and it's oh, it's just great. And then I think we have the the MVP of this movie. Uh, I, I kept calling him Gallagher in my notes, like uh, like mustacheless Gallagher, but his name is Danny. Boy. Oh, man. Whew. This is a character. Yeah. <laughs> this is an actor named Jesse Kirby. He giggles a few times, cackles a thousand times. And as a general uh, mischief maker, does does Wikipedia say what his fucking problem is? Let's see here. No, it doesn't even mention him. Well, we'll say he's a uh, a paranoid mischief schizophrenic. Schizophrenic? I just made up a word. Yeah, you did. No, seriously, he uh he doesn't uh he doesn't even make it into the paragraph about all the people. Oh, poor Danny. The old lady. Yeah. The crazy Ralph of the film. <laughs> Oh, yes. Is it, uh, is it Mrs. Callingham? Mm-hmm. Yes. What is her, what is her problem described as? She spouts bizarre poetry and mistakes flowers in the garden to be her own children. Oh, I take that back. After that, after that, it says a juvenile prankster named Danny. Oh, there it is. There he is. That's his, yep. uh, his M.O. <laughs> yeah. Juvenile prankster goes straight to the sanitarium. <laughs> Good. Fucking Gallagher. Ugh. My favorite thing about him, they, <laughs> IMDb has him in another movie, uh, mm-hmm. Logan's Run, where he played Ooh. confused city dweller. He's he's certainly not a city dweller in this film. Nope. Oh, man, should have left him locked in the fucking basement. And then don't look in there. Because mm-hmm. he's, he's, Danny's in there. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Mrs. Callingham is the old woman, and uh, she's basically deflating. It's like that kind of old. Mm, or she used yeah. to be much rounder, and now she's just a little shriveled up prune lady. Mm, the air's gone out of her. No offense to our uh, octogenarian listeners. Mm-hmm. You know we love you. <laughs> we know you. <laughs> we love you, brother. Uh, <laughs> Rhea <laughs> McAdams is her name, and uh, she was also in a movie we'll talk about later. Excellent. Yay. Okay, so I think I got all the patients. Yeah, you got them. Yay. Even uh, <laughs> little Mr. Danny. So now we have our staff, and uh, first up, of course, is Dr. Stevens, mm-hmm. and uh, Dr. Stevens, he's going to go into early retirement. Early. This sanitarium is, it's called Stevens Sanitarium, mm-hmm. or, or Stevens Nuthouse, and uh, this guy, uh, before we talk about the character, this is Michael Harvey, mm-hmm. who uh, was also in Encounter of the Unknown. Everyone was in that Man. film, apparently. <laughs> I think he went he went to Spain to to be in Duck You Sucker, the Sergio Leone movie. Wow. I mean the less parts of it were filmed here. I'm assuming it was uh in a spaghetti western shot in Spain as they often were. Um he also was also he stayed in Italy a while. He was uh once upon a time in the West as well. Seriously. Jeez. Nice work if you can get it. Uh yeah. And uh I mean neither one of those films are as good as this one, but Hey. But yeah, um, this Dr. Stevens has a terrible idea. Um, he wants to treat all of these, uh, these lunatics as, uh, family. So there's, there's no locks on any of the doors. Yeah. It's a communal kind of a living thing here. And this is a horrible idea. Terrible. And, uh, this is one of Lietta's favorite things about the movie. She pointed out to me that, uh, shouldn't these people have normal people to interact with and not each other so much? Mm. There's only so much money in the budget, Leanna. <laughs> I know. What's <laughs> up with her? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can only afford crazies. And uh, so he is teaching his method uh, of getting uh, the judge to recover from his... Uh, the thing that's eating him up inside and making him crazy is to give him a frickin' axe and have him chop mm-hmm. a log. Right. Now, Sensible. everyone's favorite nurse... Uh, Janie, Janie is a little whine, a little whiny for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this actress is Jesse Lee Fulton, and oh man, ooh, we'll be seeing her again later, of course, because you know, yes. everybody loves to work with everybody else. Right. But yeah, she was uh, just a you know a, a Texas, a local Texas actress, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and she has had enough. Uh, she's being harassed by the patients and, and she's just really sick of it. She's decided to quit and she says goodbye to Sam and Sam is heartbroken because she's been there since he's been there. And, uh, while she's distracting Dr. Stevens and telling him that she wants to quit, the judge straight up murders Dr. Stevens right in front of her with the ax. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it's great. What film came to mind? Is there a film that came to mind? Crazy people, ax murder. <laughs> A uh, house full of troubled people. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. Well, or a campground, more specifically. Right. I uh-huh. thought of just now when you said it. Frickin' uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. Yes, sir. Oh, and man. the one that gets it, and I can't remember the kid's name, but he's eating chocolate. And it, later, when we see Sam eating popsicle after popsicle, I thought, oh, <laughs> that's somewhat similar too. There you go. Then you've got. The old lady is the the crazy Ralph, the harbinger. <laughs> There's actually some uh, some similarities there. Poor crazy Ralph. Oh boy. Yep. Um, someone, uh, another person in a uh, a white uh, lab coat, Doctor Masters. Mm. I I hesitate to say Doctor, but what? Well, Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So this is uh, Annabelle Weenick, which that's a funny last name. Makes me think of a tiny penis. Wikipedia has her as Anne McAdams. Huh. I mean... Maybe she got married. I'm sure you're right. Yeah, that's one of her other names is Anne McAdams. Mm. Nailed it. Uh, let's see. She was in a ton of stuff. Jeez. Ooh, she's in Deadly Blessing, where she played Ruth Schmidt. Mm, well... Yeah, some distant family. No doubt. (laughs) Uh, We'll be seeing her again tonight in this very episode. Yeah, we will. She was also in a 1966 movie called The Street Is My Beat. Ooh. A newlywed young woman learns that her husband is a pimp and uh, ultimately goes to work for him as a call girl, dot, dot, dot. Thus begins her rapid down spiral. Uh, Well, (laughs) who would have guessed it? (laughs) Oh, wee Nick. She picked all the best movies. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> she was also in a TV movie called Curse of the Swamp Creature. Oh, that looks... Oh. Th- that's Larry Buchanan. That looks fantastic. <laughs> nice. The monster looks like someone shoved something very sharp up his butt right before they took his picture. <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> anyway, I'm losing it. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Masters, um, well, I'm going to talk about her speciality in a, in a bit when we meet our main character. Um, but she's very, uh, what do you call it, uh, suspicious right away. She doesn't exactly run to call the authorities. She decides to take care of the family, quote unquote. So, they have, she has them, uh, she has Sam haul away Dr. Stevens' body. Sam. Sam, listen to me. From now on, I'm going to take care of the family. I'm going to take care of Cameron and Janie and all the others. Do you understand? But Jane is leaving. Oh? oh? All right, listen to me. I'll be back in a few minutes to tell you what to do with Dr. Stevens. Do you understand me? And then uh, finally, we got our main character who shows up. Uh, and this is, of course, we mentioned Rosie Holotick. And she plays Nurse Charlotte Beale, not Jessica Beale. No, sharp looking lady. Yeah, sharp as a knife. And mm-hmm. uh, according to Brad, uh, she's in Encounter with the Unknown. And then I found it too. <laughs> <laughs> we agreed. So Charlotte shows up, and uh, Dr. Stevens had contacted her and wants her to work uh, with him in this uh, loony asylum. And it's cuckoo. It's cuckoo cachoo, everybody. I am the Bradman. I am the walrus. <laughs> oh, you. Uh, so, of course, uh, Dr. Masters is not uh, aware that uh, this intruder is going to be joining her on her staff. And so she's giving her shit. Yeah, it's un- inconvenient. Oh, totally inconvenient. I wrote that Dr. Masters has a master's in cock blocking, 
with a minor mm. in passive aggressivity and a PhD in fuck you, Charlotte. <laughs> that's, that's a joke I wrote. It's good. Thank you. It took up paper and ink. Because I write in pen. Took up my mind. Oh, yeah. I'm not oh, afraid yeah. to write in pen. Oh, yeah. No, you're not. I believe in permanence. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I think about Dr. Stevens, and I think about his methods, and I think maybe he shouldn't have been a doctor. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> oh, man. So, immediately, um, our, our crazy Ralph, uh, good old uh, Mrs. Callingham, tries to warn Charlotte that something is terribly wrong here. And then later, her tongue is cut out, which I could barely understand her before. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> No, but it's a gleeful performance. I lo I love this lady, Rhea McAdams. Excuse me, yeah, Rhea McAdams. She's really, really fun and has a really good time. Like if they'd had her dress as a leprechaun or something, it would have been just as, <laughs> just as apropos as this old crazy lady. <laughs> I wish there had been. I wish that had happened. When Charlotte starts to panic and one wants to get out of there because Jennifer assaults her, uh, mm -hmm. or some a bunch of shits going wrong. And uh, she decides to make a phone call. Finally, someone's calling the authorities. And, of course, the phone line is immediately cut. Mm -hmm. This alerts the telephone company that something is wrong with their line. And so they send a repairman out. <laughs> yeah, he, he says the most ridiculous thing. He says, we've noticed some fluctuations in your voltage. <laughs> Which is total bullshit. <laughs> I think they had that in the 70s. Well, maybe. And they have that now. If, if your phone is out now, the company will rush over real quick. Mm-hmm. Oh. To the middle of nowhere. Yes. We noticed you were having difficulty with your voltage. Now, I don't really know. Is this act? I'm just, by process of elimination, I'm assuming that this is Ray Daniels. That's the character's name. Oh, yeah. And this is Robert Dracup. And I thought this would have been a perfect opportunity for, for S.F. Brownrigg to do a cameo. It really would have been. Uh, this guy, he's only credited for four things, but he was in, I mean, excuse me, he was a camera and electrical engineer department. Fuck. He was a camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, turds. Uh, <laughs> he was a camera and electrical department dude. On a bunch of things, especially Mr. Nanny. Well, maybe he did know about the voltage of their phone. <laughs> oh, Mr. Nanny. I got a job to do and I'm doing it. You have to kiss Dolly. I don't kiss Dolly's. Kiss her. Don't tell anybody I did that. New Line Cinema presents Hulk Hogan. Both of you to the principal's office. Man, something's never changed. As you've never seen him before. Hulk Hogan himself, y'all. The Hulkster. Yep. Classic film. Anyway, I don't think I've seen it, but I know that it exists. <laughs> right. Yeah, it does. This guy's attitude is admirable. He's, he's just a happy-go-lucky uh, phone repairman. And then, of course, um, while he's getting uh, treated passive-aggressively by Dr. Stevens, excuse me, by Dr. Masters, uh, she leaves him alone, and of, and of course, Allison, our nympho, our uh, our sexual predator, finds him. It makes no sense that he would even come. <laughs> it really, I'm just saying. I just want to make that clear. Yes. It They're is. in the middle of nowhere. The phone is out. Who reported the phone being out? Nobody. No, they, they detected it. Mm -hmm. They detected it. Okay. <laughs> the fluctuations in the line, man. <laughs> Uh, he gets seduced, quote unquote, or just raped by, uh, Allison. It's really funny. Mm -hmm. She's coming on to him. She's coming on to him. She's coming on to him. She's screaming at him, of course, because it's a Brownrigg movie. He finally breaks and tells her, I love you, because that's what she wants. And so she takes this as an invitation and shuts the door. And then the weirdest line happens. Did you catch this right when the door shut? What, what has happened? He says, this is a man's voice that says this. He says, now look what you did. And, wow. And Leanna and I were like, what? Oh, she gave him a hard on. Oh. They're going to make the sex act. They're going to do it. Off camera. But I mean, I love this. Like, you, you read about nymphomaniacs every day on the news. Right. Wait, what was I talking about? Well, you're in Tampa. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Trampa. Trampa. Cut it out! Love is pure. Love is grace. Love is strength. You love me, your love is pure. You'll always love me. <laughs> now look what you've done. People are dropping like flies here. It turns out, dun dun dun, that Dr. Masters, of course, is not a real doctor. She's a patient. Yep. She wanted to belong, wanted to be a doctor, and so Dr. Stevens let her play along. And it's it's hinted that he let her assist him in giving Sam a lobotomy. Mm, I think that happened. That is awesome. <laughs> I didn't go to college or anything. She cut out Mrs. Callingham's tongue. She mm-hmm. kills uh, Ray, the repairman. Mm. And then she kills Jennifer. Right? Mm-hmm. Was she the one she stabbed in the eye? Yeah. Okay. I think so. She, th- there's a lot of sharp implements in this uh, insane asylum here. Um, and, of course, another spoiler here. Uh, it, it turns out that Sam, who's been talking about having conversations with uh, Dr. Stevens, has actually been having conversations with Dr. Stevens. Dr. Stevens is not dead. No. He's he's only wo- mortally wounded. <laughs> he's in the <laughs> basement. And so, you know, everyone keeps telling him, oh, Sam, you know, Dr. Stevens is dead. It's okay. But he was really talking to him. It's great. And that's why you should not look in the basement, because yeah. the worst psychiatrist of all time is down there. Exactly. Run. <laughs> Dr. Masters gets everyone to turn on Charlotte. So she has Sam grab her and they're going to give her a lobotomy. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the moment that this is about to happen, uh, Sam remembers the procedure that happened to him and he decides to go on an ax murder and spree. Oh, well, mm-hmm. excuse me. Um, he convinces all the other patients to rise up against Dr. Masters. Then he gets an ax and kills all of them. Yeah. And then he has a popsicle. Yep. And then, of course, um, good old Charlotte, although she'll probably never be the same again. She certainly might not work in the uh, psychiatric community ever again. She leaves sort of a Suspiria ending, except no witches, nothing's mm-hmm. on fire, but right. there is rain and a girl smiling. Mm-hmm. And boom. And then he does something that I enjoy, and I, he shows all the people in the film and puts their name. Yeah. You know? I like that. Oh man, it's so good. Like just gives you a little clip show and then has all the mm-hmm. actors. And this is yeah, this is such a tell because SF Brownrig, I really feel like he was an actor's director and he chose these crazy people as his mm-hmm. uh his troop. Ah, oh, man. That is the whole plot of uh, Don't Look in the Basement minus that a, is. minus about 45 minutes of sweating and shouting. Shouty sweating. I was going to say shitting, but that's just, that's just poop. That's just poop. <laughs> so, Brad, <laughs> how do you like this one? Okay, so I've got some thoughts on the old Don't Look in the Basement Death War 13. Bring it. One, as I mentioned earlier, you at home right now or wherever you are listening, you have a copy of this. I guarantee it. Public domain. Yes. Uh, if not, it's on YouTube. <laughs> I was talking to David Ladd. And I posed a question. I said, take my stepmother, for instance, who's a who's a bright woman, cares nothing about cinema, technique, any of that. Well, if I showed her, don't look at the basement and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, could she tell the difference? Could she tell that, <laughs> would, she, would she understand that don't look at the basement is not a great film? Although I like it, don't get me wrong. Whereas Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a great film. There's style. And there's a little bit of style in Don't Look in the Basement. There's a candid, candid angle shot. And uh, on the stairwell to the basement, there's a pretty neat little shot there. It's just it goes to what I think, I, I think we discussed this on another episode about how certain films become classics while others do not. And of course, it's subjective, but of course, there's all these things going on in Texas Chainsaw Massacre that make it a classic, whereas this one not. But I I just find it interesting how people, you know, latch on to things. My stepmother, who hate, hates horror films, she would not be able, I don't think, to really... <laughs> she, could, she wouldn't be able to articulate why one 
is great and one is not. And it just kind of strikes me as interesting. I do find, and I'll, I'll speak on this later in the episode as well, but I do find a lot of charm. And Elizabeth, she said, I, I looked for a different word other than charm and couldn't find one. She's like, I think you're right. I just, there's a lot of charm that goes on. Of course, there's some parallels with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They're both shot in Texas, uh, in a secluded area. They've both kind of got that feeling. There's just something, there's just something about regional horror, ex- especially from the seventies that just really hits a sweet spot with me, even if the film is not just absolutely outstanding. I do think this is bound to be his best known film. Easily. Yeah. And I do think that it does have merit as a film. Totally. It, you know, if you have seen, I don't know, three or four horror films, you know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> There's no pretense, really, to the uh, the shocking twist. <laughs> uh, it was released by Hallmark Releasing Corp, which also released uh, Mark of the Devil, Last House on the Left, uh, The Blind Dead, Twitch of the Death Nerve, which is Bay of Blood, of nice. course, was released by them. One of my favorites, The House That Vanished which is Jose Zaraz. It's originally titled Scream and Die. Yeah. That's a favorite of mine. And oddly enough, they also released What Have You Done to Solange as The School That Couldn't Scream. Oh, that is so great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> Play that with The School of Death and uh, The House That Screamed. And all that, man, good times. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is a lot to enjoy in this film. And like I said, it's not a lot of close-ups. It's not exactly, you know, it's not Halloween or the Texas Chainsaw Master, <laughs> but I think there's a lot to enjoy here. Uh, I had seen it. This was my third viewing. I watched it actually with Elizabeth way back in the early days of our relationship when we were just watching every horror movie we could find. Uh, then I went to Vermont on a trip and this was over three years ago. We were planning this this actual oh super show. Oh my god, are you serious? Yes. Uh, January 11th, 2014, <laughs> I sat in my hotel room and I watched all four SF Brown I films. And I made, now. Yeah, I made notes, my Evernote. I've switched phones since then. So the other day when I watched this, uh, I pulled up my Evernote account, logged in, and there are my notes on this nice. film. <laughs> from over three years ago. Oh, man. People, that goes to show how far ahead we we plan various things that just yeah. don't get around to them. Exactly. But yeah, no, I do. I like this one. Awesome. Oh, thanks for picking up the slack on the on the freaking other movies this was released with. I, I, I always do that, and then today it was like, no. <laughs> I just forgot. Well, I found a really nice article at Horrorpedia about Hallmark Releasing Corp, and they actually... For Mark of the Devil, they actually released a vomit bag. Yeah. So good. And of course, this is the sort of thing, you know, and probably one of the reasons they retitled this so many times is just they kept releasing it. You just, you know, you change the name and hope that people come see it. In fact, I mean, it used to be pretty standard practice that if the film, when it was first run, didn't do well, just change the name and release it again. Yep. Uh, supposedly, the budget for this was $100,000. I thought that very... Very, very hard to believe. Uh, what did the, that was all on it? Earplugs for the crew, I guess. Yeah, even in 1973, I don't know what they. I mean, they must have split the 80 grand. They, they spent it on a sitar. Yes, <laughs> and I'm sure all these films have. Uh, well, a lot of these films have library music. Yeah, this one, this one, the music does not stand out, but the sitar is nice. I mean, who doesn't love a sitar? Okay, so the music is credited to Robert Farrar, um, who did, of course, uh, th- the next film we're going to talk about, and then uh, the next film we're going to talk about, and then later he did the next film we're going to talk about. Very well. So that's the next three films. Um, he also did a, a hilarious movie that I I don't know if we'll ever cover on the show, but it's very special. Terror at Ten Killer? Ooh. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> You know what, that, that, I, I would cover that with you. I've not seen it, but to me, that screams one word and one word alone. What? Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Jeffrey and I are going to do the movie that's always released with. Uh huh, The Last Slumber Party. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, Last Slumber Party is, is a whole bag of something. 
and <laughs> Terra 10 Killer is a, a little tiny bag of something. It's it's great. I love it. You know, I've not seen either. I've not seen either one. Oh, you're in for a treat with Last Slumber Party, man. You're gonna if you like likable characters, don't watch that movie. Mm. What I love about good old Don't Look in the Basement, aka Death Ward number thirteen, there is actually a film coming out called Death Ward thirteen. It's in pre-production. They're trying to get funding for it, and it says on the poster, "Inspired by Don't Look in the Basement." So wow, and nice. I was like, "Go for it." Apparently, one of the misfits is going to be in it. So there you go. <laughs> Very nice. The ins- the ensemble cast in this movie is on fire. Like this is this is like I said earlier, an actor's movie because SF Brown Rig. He's just oh man, it's just crazy. Um, I I love the color palette on this. I know there's a Blu-ray that just came out. It's it's uh, Blu-ray with this movie and the sequel that his son did. Um, but I I kind of don't want to see this restored. I like. VCI, it didn't put out a shitty copy or anything, but they just put out the widescreen. Ooh, they nice. They didn't do a, like any like real restoration, so it looks beautiful. Uh, and also, this is one of those movies, speaking of retitling, where it's really obvious that they covered up the original title. When the movie starts, the all the font is one way, and then all of a sudden, Don't Look in the Basement pops up, and it's this big, ugly font with like this Jackson Pollock-looking background. So you know they were just covering up the subtle, the forgotten. Mm. I love watching the lunatics interact with each other. Like there's lots of scenes, of course, uh, with Doctor Masters, who's you know eventually she's her her performance is really good because it starts like she's a real doctor and then slowly she gets more and more um, unethical with these people. Watching Sam and Sarge interact and watching. Sam and the Judge and Allison and the Judge and just everyone interact. All the crazies interacting is beautiful. Let's see. And that twist, when you think about the twist in this movie, I say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on, shame on, won't get fooled again. (laughs) I think I got it. I think that's close to what, what W said. I love it. You nailed it. Of course, he also said all those... OBGYNs practicing their love with women. That's also great. Most quotable president? Probably. Is this the first Dote film? Oh, well, you know, it's like, uh, let's see, don't, don't films. <laughs> don't go in the house, don't answer the phone. I don't know. That's a good question. Where all are the don't films? Don't open till Christmas. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to cover that one someday uh, for a Christmas episode. Heck yeah. Yeah, don't go in the house, don't answer the phone, don't be afraid of the dark. Oh, uh, the living dead at Manchester Morgue was don't open the window? Yes, sir. Uh, don't look now. There's the TV movie Don't Go to Sleep. There's the horrible Italian shit show called Don't Look in the Attic, which I do not recommend. Really? I Dude, I, I love crappy Italian horror, but that is like, ugh, terrible. A bridge too far. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a 1979 film called Don't Go Near the Park. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. That one's pretty fun. Uh, There's that weird one, uh, Don't Deliver Us From Evil, from 1971. Mm -hmm. So that could be the first. Let me backtrack for just a moment. Don't Torture Duckling. Oh, yeah, (laughs) don't do that. (laughs) So when when our nurse is going, when she's discovered that, um, that Dr. Masters is a lunatic, and she's, you know, making the rounds, so to speak. She opens the door, and the old nymphomaniac is laying there with the dead telephone yes. repairman. Can you necrofeel me? I almost missed it. Thank you. Yeah. And she says something about interrupting us on our wedding night. Yes. And really, this film, it's bloody. Yeah. It's pretty It's pretty out there. Which reminds me, uh, this was a video nasty. Was it really? Yeah. This was banned by the BBFC, y'all. The uh, Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> oh, man. I got to recommend uh, another one of these Legion podcasters, uh, good old Duncan. Uh, he did a series uh, called uh, Doing the Nasty, and it was all about the video nasties. Oh, yeah. It's so he a good covered this one, didn't he? Oh, yeah. I've listened to uh, parts of that series. It was good. Oh, yeah. Super good. There's also Don't Go in the Woods Alone. From 1991, which is balls out crazy. Mm. Uh, don't hang up. 
aka don't open the door. That's that get, that counts as two. Yeah, that's actually coming up. There's something called Don't Talk to Strange Men from 1962, which uh, that could be the very first don't. Wow. But of course, we're forgetting, uh, where's the uh, title? It's a long title, so it's hard to remember. Oh, I know what you're going to say. Don't be a menace <laughs> to South Central while <laughs> drinking your juice in the hood, which was supposed to be gin and juice, but they couldn't have that in the title. Right. Yep. I, rem- I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> I think we can move on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, So let's jump right in. I'm going to go ahead and play the trailer for, thank God I found this trailer, uh, for Poor White Trash 2, a.k.a. Scum of the Earth. See how they live below Tobacco Road. Oh, don't you know what girls is for? Don't tow. I've been watching. Scum of the Earth. The real poor white trash. They live and die ah! below Tobacco Road. She killed him. That witch woman in yonder. She found out how they live below Tobacco Road. You remember that little private talk he's gonna have? Pick an ever wanting man who takes what he wants. Sarah, his trouble loving daughter. What makes you think she'd want to have anything to do with a smelly old hog like you know how? Shut! Emmy, his girl wife. Take me. You know I'm always ready for when you want some loving. Right, get the hell out of my way. Dumb. I knowed how you got that dollar, and I'm gonna go tell Paul. I'm gonna put a hex on you. And the unseen watches. <coughs> and strikes. <coughs> What you hear? Please, don't kill me. No power on earth can exercise the terror from scum of the earth. The real poor white trash. Um, I went ahead and did a common cast and crew comparison here uh, for uh, The Forgotten, a.k.a. Don't Look in the Basement, and Scum of the Earth, a.k.a. Poor White Trash 2, and I found that there are 12 returning wow. cast and crew members. Sound department, cinematographer, art director, producer, composer, special effects, makeup, editor, director, and then three of the cast members, Camilla Carr, Gene Ross, and Hugh Fegan, are all in this. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, now, the original Poor White Trash uh, was a film from 1957 called Bayou that uh, was retitled as uh, Poor White Trash. I was watching clips from it on YouTube today, and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. It has one of the most important weirdo actors ever, Timothy Carey. Ever. Uh, Timothy Carey plays a Cajun. He's amazing because he's crazy. Look up uh, Poor White Trash, Timothy Carey, Crazy Dance, and watch his dance that he does. Wow. And it's it's the most Cajun thing I've ever seen, even though I've been to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like a piece of shit. I don't know. Peter Graves is in it. I can't imagine that it's better than this. It looks like a really exploitative, or, or maybe a movie that was trying to be a message movie and failed miserably, but I think it was popular enough in the drive-in to inspire this. He made this good old uh, Scum of the Earth uh-huh. in, God, what year was this? 74? And then it didn't get released until 76, when somebody, somebody retitled it as Poor White Trash 2. I mean, the first one, they're not related, obviously, no. as you said. Was it that well known that from 1957 to 1976, almost 20 years later? Honestly, I think it was what we're experiencing now with title recognition. I think it's it's just just to cash in on something that people might have vaguely remembered. Exactly. <laughs> 
Let's see. Uh, Scum of the Earth, I, there's not a lot of information as to the production company Zizon Enterprises. Uh, mm. I can't <laughs> find <laughs> I can't find who distributed it. Distributed it, it, it. Distributed by Dimension Pictures. Not that Dimension Pictures. Not that one, but a few of the films that Dimension Pictures uh, released. Gator Bait. <laughs> nice. Deli- Deliver Us from Evil. There you go. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. Oh. And a very special film, The Devil's Wedding Night. Yes. Oh, which is an man. all-time favorite. Speaking of special, oh boy. Mm-hmm. What a great movie. There is a VHS-looking... It looks like Magnum Entertainment put out the VHS of uh, Poor White Trash 2, and it says, Go into the bayou, and you may never come out. Wow. <laughs> I found a pretty cool poster. It has got a woman in a short yellow dress sitting on a porch with a shotgun. Yes, yes. It says, She found out how they live below Tobacco Road. Scum of the earth. See the real Poor White Trash. I'm going to Google Tobacco Road. Is that a real thing? It is a real thing. Oh, look at that. Yes, sir. Tobacco Road refers to a historic tobacco-producing area of central North Carolina. Mm, Absolutely. And is often used when referring to sports, particularly basketball. Man. Duke, North Carolina, North Carolina State, Wake Forest. Man. If I ever have a brain injury, we will talk about sports, my friend. Let's hope it never happens. Because that's how you know something is horribly wrong with me. <laughs> yes. So I often check up on you that way. I'm like, so did you catch the game last night? Uh, folks at home, I blew Brad's mind one day when I was uh, sitting at the cigar bar here in Tampa, Florida, texting Brad in Kentucky. <laughs> and I started talking about the game that was on. Mm-hmm. Alabama versus Tennessee. He was like, what is wrong with you? Are you okay? Yes, immediately. <laughs> And we watched a game together. Yes, we did. Oh, it was good. I was like, I can't believe these downs. Like, I hate the downs. I'm like, just get on with it. Like, <laughs> football's so slow. I'll just put it this way. Richard had some very, very good suggestions on how to improve the game of football. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm waiting to hear back from Dick Buttkiss on it. Mm-hmm. So, this movie... Uh, it starts off, eventually, <laughs> it starts off with a couple played by, what is the name of the girl? Helen? Helen, played by Norma Moore. Thank you. Uh, she and her husband show up. Her husband, Paul, uh, played by Joel with an unfortunate name, Kolodner. Mm-hmm. Um, he was also in a few things, too. These people, are, it's like, I keep expecting this to be their only movie, Brad. Oh, no. This was his oh, no. debut. Uh, Norma Moore was in an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger. Shh. Boom. Career over. I mean, just Bam. beginning. She's also in Problem Child, where she played one of the nuns that uh, dumps the horrible kid on John Ritter. God, that movie's so bad. How? The sequel's better. I don't, I don't think I knew there was one. Yeah, there is. It's called Problem Child 2. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> the problemating. <laughs> the problemating. More problem. More children, more problems. Chapter two. Uh, so they arrive at a cabin at the lake, and uh, while Helen goes inside to prepare a meal, I'm presuming, because her husband... Get a drink. Oh, to get, get a, a drink. drink. Paul's kind of a yeah. dickhead. He immediately gets freaking axe murdered. Immediately. Boom. We jump right into it. Yeah, we do. I'm like, I love it. So, Brad, what do you think? Proto Slasher here? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so we say goodbye to Paul, and then the immediately, amazingly inappropriate music kicks in. It's a song that uh, it, that references one of the one of the titles. Hold on, "Killing's a Family Affair." Or yes. Something. Uh, and, and then the lyrics change later. It's so good. Uh, but it's it just takes you right out of the movie immediately. Immediately. <laughs> So share it with someone who cares, nobody else, 
nobody else is worth the gift. Your life is strictly your own. But don't try to go it alone. Times ain't so hard to bear. Death is a family affair. Uh, she's running through the, the woods to, to uh, get away from her husband's body. And uh, she gets intercepted by a character named Odie or Otis. Yeah. Okay, Otis. But they call him Odie. And they call him Pick. Yeah, because his last name's Pickett. And this is Gene Ross. The, the judge has returned. Yes. He's definitely fallen on hard times after being killed. As one does. <laughs> He's like, you need any sexy help? Yeah, because I got it. <laughs> Oh, uh, he's got what ladies want. He takes her home with him to the, meet her fa- his family. Well, he, he tells her, I got a phone. Your husband, you say, has been murdered. We'll go call somebody and tell him. But I definitely didn't do it. <laughs> but I, it wasn't me, so don't get that idea. I ain't gonna kill you. I ain't killed nobody lately. <gasps> what did you want? What did you do him for? I done told you. I don't know nothing about no killing. Who been killed? Why did it happen? My husband. I began then. Help me. Please help me. Well now. What kind of hit you talking about? Okay, so we go back to the house. His his, his uh I'm gonna call it a shanty, uh, where we meet the family. Uh we meet uh Emmy. Now, Emmy is played by Anne Stafford, and uh, we'll be seeing her again later in this episode. Yeah. Emmy is is blonde, the blonde, very sad story. She's pregnant. Right. Okay. She's going to have Otis's baby, even though for some reason it's really confusing. She's not related to him by blood, so I don't understand that. Well, her father traded her off. He owed Odie... Or pick some money, <laughs> but didn't have the money to pay him. So even though she was in love with a boy named Jason, Jason didn't have any money. So her father just traded her off like you do here in the South. I know. Yeah, over some money. And don't forget Florida f- people. People forget just how Southern Florida is. We only have a brief interlude of non-Southernness because of the beach and Disney World. We're basically penis Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the New York transplants. Penis Alabama. Penis Alabama. Yeah, that's the, going on the board. The New Yorkers who come here really help everything out. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I tell you, I've been in I've been several places in the Panhandle, and it is indistinguishable from Georgia, Alabama, New York City, New York City. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, we also meet, uh, I mean, obviously Emmy is like my favorite character on earth. Oh, she is great. Ugh, such a good actress. How is this actress? She looks familiar. She's really good. She looks like a girl, a girl that I used to know. Nice. Years ago. I paused the film last night when we were watching it and I found her on Facebook and Elizabeth agreed. Yes, yeah, she does look like her. See, there you go. And then you got, uh, Sarah. Uh, played by Camilla Carr. She's returning from uh, from her, her horrible murder at the end of Don't Look in the Basement. And uh, <laughs> she's basically a STD-ridden uh, tramp. Yeah. And how is she related to Pick? It's his daughter. And they've had sex. Yes. It is, it is intimated that they made the sex act. <laughs> we don't see it, thank God. Oh, man. But... Well, it, my fan fiction has more of it. <laughs> are you going to elaborate or just let all of our minds or the wheels are turning? <laughs> no, let's let's just leave that to the imagination. So, of course, there's no fucking telephone. No. Shocker. Then the final member of this family. You know, I'm having the weirdest deja vu, Brad. Have we recorded this before? <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I have dreamt this moment. Four years ago, I dreamt this moment. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> the final member of the family comes home, which is Bo. Bo, I'm going to say it just like that. Mm-hmm. Bo Pickett played, oh my God, his IMDb picture. Holy shit. Yeah, that's his picture from Jason of Star Command. <gasps> oh my God. Uh, he is actually 
probably the most well known. He he does not maintain his own page. <laughs> no, he is actually in Evening Shade. If anybody knows, I mean, he's one of those guys you're like, I know who he is. Yeah, he was in Evening Shade. What a career. he's actually been in a lot of stuff, dude. He had a recurring uh, character. Married with children. Yeah, he's in Fight Club. He's in Liar Jeez. Liar. Man, oh man. She's all that. Isn't that one of your uh, teen movies? No. I hate that movie. Sorry. No, it's okay. I, I didn't I didn't realize until like uh, second viewing. I was like, fuck this movie. This is terrible. I, I did not know. I'm, I apologize. No, it's okay. I, I just, I didn't mean to lash out at you. Oh, I understand. <laughs> uh, he was in the Invaders from Mars remake. Heck yeah. yeah. The Toby Hooper one? Yeah. You know that that's that's kind of a fun movie. I love that movie. I don't know what everybody's problem yeah. is. I mean, the 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 original is great. Mm -hmm. The original is amazing, aimed at kids, but it was such a scary movie that it twisted the minds of many people. But I loved that remake when it came out. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. I love yeah, to rewatch that. Uh, he's in a movie called Encounter with the Unknown. Now is that a? <laughs> <What> the fuck? <laughs> Gee, was like Encounter with the Unknown, like the the we're gonna make all these people's careers movie. Like I have to watch this now. Bo comes home. He's his no count son, which I laughed and laughed about because Brad, uh, you're from the South. I am indeed. And uh, you once texted me, "Is that any count?" When I was talking about a movie, and I was like, "What?" And you had to explain to me what that was. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've said my entire life. I remember uh, whenever I say it or ask it, I always think of Carl because Carl thought that that was just hilarious. And I think <laughs> it is a, it's a bastardization of asking if something, you know, what is it? It's a count. Is it a good account? Bad account? Is it any count? Well, Bo is no count. No, absolutely not. He's an idiot. Helen is. Trapped in this house with these people. She's brought there under, you know, not quite right circumstances. Right, right. And then she's just dumped into this crazy family drama where there's everyone's playing each other for, I don't know, uh, vittles or something. I think they actually say victuals. Victuals, yeah. I'm like, yes. Sarah has a magazine because <laughs> she got a dollar. And Bo's like, wait a minute, I know how you got that dollar. I saw you having sex with all them people. <laughs> For a dollar. I love it. For a dollar. Man, she really is poor. White trash, too. <laughs> Ooh, I see what you did there. I know how you got that dollar, and I'm going to go tell Paul. <laughs> you don't know nothing. Yeah, I do. Harley Johnson told me. He and Marvin give you that so they could do it to you. You shut your mouth! Whore! That's what you are? Whore! They told me so. Whore, whore! I'm gonna go tell Paul. You ain't telling nobody nothing. You get away from me, Dad! I'll cut that tongue of yours out by the roof! Paul! Paul! Shut up! So Helen, Helen just gives up. Like Helen's like, okay, fine, I'll I'll flop down on this chair here and just kind of like, whatever. She's she's grieving and she's lost her mind, so it's great. Um, there's some skinned possum comedy. They bring home dinner. Oh my gosh! Oh Lord, have mercy! <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Now, while all of this is going on, while she's just dropped into freaking uh, Mama's family, Mama, <laughs> great show. I used to hate that show when I was a kid. Like I hated it. Like I would yell really? at, I would yell at the TV, and now I think it's great. This is this is embarrassing, but I've always loved Wallace. <laughs> I was a dumb kid, so no, you were probably a smart kid. Oh God, no, no, I met me. While all this is happening, there's a mysterious figure watching the house. We get some nice POV shots. There's your yeah, we do your extra bit of proto slashery goodness there. Yes, sir. After Helen's given up, she gives the greatest like mini kind of monologue here about how she feels numb. It's just a great... I'm going to drop that in right here. It's so beautiful. You lay down for a while and you feel better. I don't think I'll ever feel anything again. It's like... I'm numb. I felt everything there is to feel tonight. And now it's all over. 
I said before that Emmy is my favorite. Now, of course, uh, my second favorite is Sarah. Because this actress, Camilla Carr, she was intense in uh, Don't Look in the Basement. And she's equally manic and insane in this movie. Like, mm-hmm. I'm surprised her makeup didn't melt off of her. It was so good. Oh, man. Uh, she, there's, some, there's a bit where she uh, is acting like a witch. Where uh, she she tells Bo that he done she done hexed him, <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, and so she kind of takes credit for uh, their mom their mother's death uh, inadvertently. <laughs> oh man! And then all of a sudden, uh, they go out to the uh, the well and they're going to get water. No, sir. They're going to pull up a bucket full of shine. <laughs> yeah, a, literally a bucket full of jars of shine. So, uh, Pick is just drinking shine, and this immediately makes everything deteriorate. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, of course, uh, I wrote in my notes, pass the shine, uh, let's get rapey. Mm-hmm. Now, the movie was kind of teasing with the rape. Obviously, the sexual tension is there. It will eventually give in, and there will be a, a, a very restrained but uh, harrowing rape scene. Yeah, I could have done without it. Oh yeah, that's that's what keeps this movie from being like next level awesome for me. It kind of like hurts my enjoyment of it. Um, oh no! But we'll get to that in a bit. Then Bo gets killed. They they uh they <laughs> they send Bo out. Go get what is he supposed to be doing? You know, I really don't know. I don't remember. Oh no, no, I know. Um, uh, Amy tries to get her get him to go get help for for uh, Helen. So. Pick doesn't realize that that's what what Bo has gone yeah. to do, and so uh, he gets he gets murderized pretty impressively, really, pretty bloody. This movie's got some nice gore in it. I mean, nothing nothing uh, expensive looking or anything. Or very convincing. But it looked it looked okay. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> no, he gets impaled on a fence like a steel steel rod fence. Yeah, and that's when uh, after they find him dead because uh, I think the killer just leaves the body out front. Uh, right outside the door. That's when he says, who'd want to kill Bo? He weren't much count. He weren't much count. <laughs> what What is so funny here is that at this point, still, no one is like, we got to call the fucking cops. Yeah. Why would anyone want to kill Bo? Yeah. Oh, so good. It's uh, very convenient that there's no law anywhere. <laughs> um, there's a great magic editing moment that I don't know if you noticed. When they're... Uh, Pick is is grieving over dead Bo. He uh, asks for a jar of shine, and of course, Sarah has to go get it. She goes to get it. They don't show her leaving. They don't show her coming back. Next thing you know, he's got a a, a fresh jar of shine, and she's back on the couch. Mm-hmm. It is so clunky. I loved it. Mm-hmm. She teleported that shit. Yes, she did. <laughs> uh, there's some pretty awkward. It's dark around the house, but when Bo's out in the woods, it's it's daylight. Day for night fail. Very nice. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So good. So then um, Sarah goes out to get the preacher? They want to do Bo up nice. There's some consternation about the fact that they're just going to bury Bo in a box in the backyard. <laughs> Bo won't mind. That'll just cost money if we have a funeral. Yep. So there's some argument about who's going to clean Bo up. For this impend- impending burial, Emmy offers to do it, but he says no. We'll make that city girl clean her up. It's, it's all her fault. Yeah, there's this whole thing where they keep blaming her for all this bullshit. <laughs> but yet, no one has done anything about the fact that there is a murderer outside. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Reckon we should we lock the door? No. Nah. We'll just all go to bed. I'll rape this girl. Oh, go to bed. Man, and it, there's, there's a great moment in the morning when he remembers that Bo died. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, rape is serious business. Yeah. You might forget that, uh, you know, your boy died. <laughs> so while Sarah is out trying to do her, her thing... She meets the killer and sort of tries to seduce him, right? Yeah. You got a dollar? Yeah, you got a dollar? Oh, Rocky World. <laughs> then, of course, he uh, strangles her with uh, barbed wire. 
Well, yeah. And we think she's dead. Spoiler alert. Yep. And then uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pick runs out with the gun to go take on this killer himself. And in the most amazing scene, the killer rips his shotgun out of his hand and then blows him away with it. He kills him with his own gun by just taking it. Yep. He just sneaks up on him, grabs it, blows him away. Shoots him in the face. Yeah, I think the impact of Bo's untimely demise and the raping has just, <laughs> has just, you know, leveled Pick. Yep, just sapped out his life energy. He's got the whole overalls with no shirt fashion <laughs> going on. I wore that to work today. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this was the South. Oh my gosh. It's just Emmy and Helen left at the house. And who mm-hmm. shows up to, to reveal that they were the killer the whole time? Helen's 11th hour husband. <laughs> which I hate to say this. I never figure out movies before they, the ending comes. But dude, this was so simple. She mentions her husband who died in the war. Uh-huh. And because, you know, her and Emmy are talking about the good men they lost. And sure, so sure enough, uh, I was like, oh, it's her husband killing all these people. And then he shows up. She's like, you're dead. I read about it in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this this is uh, good old uh, Sarge, Sergeant Jaffe. And he, uh, yeah, so he, he's, uh, he's back after being brutally murdered. To uh, brutally murder people, and he has a he has a great speech about not being dead, and of course she served him uh, divorce papers while he was away in the war. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's an interesting side note from my perspective. I've seen this movie twice, and I missed both times her saying that she had a husband. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, as I'm a big fan, as you know, of. Uh, detective novels, Golden Age Mystery, there is a component called fair play. And it's, it, you know, is a book fairly clued? You know, are the clues there for the reader? And I'm like, this is the opposite of fair play. <laughs> like, she just has this husband that she's on the honeymoon with her new husband. And so I miss that altogether. It's all real. And uh, they get the better of a uh, good old uh, husband. It was Jim, I think. <laughs> 11th hour Jim. Right. And uh, so, next thing you know, it's just just, just Emmy and uh, Helen sitting on the porch, kind of just waiting for help to come. Emmy says, I'll I'll take care of you. Oh, it's so sad. Like, the whole... This, this movie, to me, has, like, a sadder theme to it than the other movie. Like, at least Charlotte got away in the first movie. Yeah. Well, I think... I think he did the right thing. Emmy is the is the best character as far as the uh, the country folk. Yeah. She is not rattled by anything. She's pregnant with this monster's baby. <laughs> and uh she's been tra- traded away by her daddy for what I assume is probably no more than $50. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was probably way less than that. But she just she's very she's very friendly. She is almost pure, even though she's not. You know what I'm saying? She's just very... Yeah. So I was glad that they did not kill... 11th Hour Jim is actually murdered by Sarah, who was not killed oh, by the... Oh, thank you. Yeah. That was the part yeah. I forgot. Yeah, Sarah, with her uh, her holes in her neck from the barbed wire, just crawls in and blows them away. Yeah, with the shotgun. Yeah. I have never seen or read anything by Tennessee Williams, but I'm well-read enough to know what that is like. <laughs> And if this is just like a Tennessee Williams play directed by S.F. Brown. <laughs> with with a, just a dash of uh, of William Faulkner, just for fun. There you go. Boom. Now, I had said to you, and I stand by the statement, S.F. Brown rig is the poor man's, poor man's Charles B. Pierce. <laughs> who is actually a, a... Can you imagine if they collaborated? It would be amazing. Ah, oh, I love it. So... How do you like this one, dude? I like this one. I do agree. I wish there wasn't that rape scene because uh, Pick is plenty awful without that. The dialogue is just amazing where like Sarah and Bo are talking about the dollar for the magazine. She's like, last time you looked at one of my periodicals, you got grease all over it. <laughs> oh, that wasn't grease. 
Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there, again, lo- like there is with Don't Look in the Basement, there is just a certain ramshackle, shambolic charm to the film. Yeah. Typically, and I was going to say this earlier, typically, you know me, I will double dip and triple dip, and quadruple dip to get a better version of a film. But these films, I don't think they need better versions. I think that that's part of the charm. Yeah. Well, the the version of this I have is so shitty that I, I would like to see it. Just, I think I'd like to see it one more time in a wide screen, just even if it ever turns up. Mm-hmm. Just to give it that that next. I understand because I I did like it a lot. It just it it never will be a movie I love. You know. Well, I'm surprised you didn't mention the the skinned possum, which had to be real. It looked it. Oh, I mentioned it. I call it the skinned possum comedy. Ugh. But yeah, it was it was nasty. It was cuckoo. And they ate it. Mm-hmm. Mm. They fed the crew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm from the south, and I I have never eaten possum that I'm aware of. <laughs> oh man, all the Vietnamese restaurants around here they're strictly possum. Strictly possum. Mm. Um, I like this movie. Like I was saying, uh, the the dialogue is as subtle as a, as a napalm being dropped on a fireworks factory. Wow. Uh, the movie is slow and, yeah, it is and slow. stagey, but because of the actors, it's dynamic enough to where I wasn't bored. I did notice that uh, I thought it was going to be over soon, and it still had about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was a little uh, dip in the pacing, <laughs> or a continual uh, lower dip, like yeah, like tobacco. Total, total proto-slasher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I liked all the mouth breathing and uh, the endless drawling on every word. I liked the sweaty hair across Pick's face. Oh, God, yes. Like that comb over. <laughs> oh, man. It's like a comb down. <laughs> you know, he his character here is, is very different than the judge, and he pulled off both, really. Totally, totally. Um, I love the fuzz guitar that they used during Bo's death scene. I wish there had been more of that. That was the only nice. time I really noticed the music other than the family affair song, which at the end of the movie, I think it goes, it's a final affair. Yeah. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> clever. Don't go hiding for death. It won't do you no good <laughs> or something. That's adorable. <laughs> and true. Well, if you don't mind, let's, uh, let's move on from this uh, poor white trash too. What do you say? I uh, say let's go. All right, and uh, folks, here is the trailer for our next film right now. After 13 years away from home, she returned to a house of terror. Shocking motion picture of suspense and horror. There was no place to hide from fear or death. What do you want, Claude? I know what you and Crawler did to Miss Harriet. Take only so much fear. Again, after you see, don't open the door. Rated PG. Okay, folks, that was the trailer for Don't Open the Door, a.k.a. Don't Hang Up. 
aka the House of the Seasons, which I like. Mm. That makes it sound like a Jose Ramon Larraz film to me. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're off to a good start. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever worry, like, you're in another room, you hear that, you're like, oh, she's just, she just had a chill. Do you ever worry, like, maybe she's in trouble? <laughs> no. I'm the one who's in trouble. You're the one that's in trouble. Because that's me doing that. You're talking to Lietta. What? Uh... Ooh, what a twist. <laughs> okay, so um, on the not-so-great uh, DVD for uh, Don't Open the Door, I mean, I love VCI because they exist, but uh, Don't Look in the Basement is like anamorphic widescreen, looks pretty good. Don't Open the Door, non-anamorphic widescreen. So they put out this new quote-unquote edition in the mid to late 2000s. And instead of really releasing Don't Open the Door properly, they just made a copy of their old disc. Has VCI right. ever done that before? <laughs> <laughs> Has VCI ever not done that before? <laughs> Here's a quick side story. So I bought uh, Blood and Black Lace, the old, old, old VCI disc, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. Then I heard there was this new edition. They're going to put out a new edition, like the band, new edition. Right. And I was all excited because, you know, I want more Blood and Black Lace. I want more extras and everything. Absolutely. I, so I sold my copy of uh, Blood and Black Lace for a lot of money and bought this uh, double disc and realized my folly very quickly. Yeah. Because they just made a bad copy. They didn't even make a good copy of their own movie that they had released. They made <laughs> so I immediately sold that and lucked out and bought Another copy of the old Blood and Black Lace VCI DVD. Yes, sir. Fool me once, shame on dudes. Fool me twice, I'm a looky loo. When we had our famous Giallothon and had people here, Matthew brought Blood and Black Lace. Oh. And it was the double disker, and he said, you can have it. He left it here. Well, I didn't know about the older version. I ended up, like, probably two years later buying the older one. And that was the best copy I had until the era of Blu-ray. Yeah. But no, I feel you because <laughs> it is night and day. Oh, man. What were they thinking? Oh, right. Money. Money. At least they poured it over the Tim Lucas commentary. At least they did. That would be funny if they had someone else reading it. <laughs> 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 like the uh, the janitor at the VCI studios. <laughs> Just mispronouncing all the names wrong. Once again, you know... Uh, good old SF Brown rig probably wanted to call this film the house of the seasons, but of course it was retitled for the, uh, good old drive in circuit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this was shot in, uh, Jefferson, Texas. And, uh, my copyright date on the, uh, the version that I think everybody has is 1979. Right. Which is crazy because this is definitely not a late seventies film at all. No, I read an article that I'll bring up later. Yeah. It said that he actually filmed all of his films within a two-year period. Oh, that's so amazing. All four of the oh horror thrillers. God. Dude, that's why they have that through line, you know? Mm -hmm. So good. Um, so why don't we jump into what this film is about? Because Miss Post, Miss Post, Miss Post, Miss Post, Miss Post. Who, who's in this? Who is that? That <laughs> actress? <laughs> that, oh, the, the <laughs> character's name is Miss Post. <laughs> mm, Miss Post. Miss Post. Movie opens with a, a lady on a train, and uh, we recognize this lady because yeah, do you. it's uh, it's a uh, Doctor What's Her Face. Doctor What's Her Face. Uh, <laughs> Is it Annabelle Weenick? Yes. Oh my god, I I really am so sick of IMDb. I need to stop using it. <laughs> okay, so Doctor uh, Doctor Masters is back, and uh, this time. They're, now, they're on a train car, <laughs> her and uh, this judge character, which is interesting because this is Gene Ross. MVP. Yes, he was a, he was a judge, and, and mm -hmm. then he was a hillbilly. <laughs> yeah. Now he's a judge again. Exactly. Of course, this train is very fun because it is a train car, and he has a tape recorder playing Sounds of Trains. Like, it was so amazing because you can tell within the shot that they're not moving. Right. And then she leaves the train car and Elizabeth and I said, you know, I could have sworn <laughs> that we were hearing train sounds. <laughs> and then he goes to a cabinet 
and turns the tape player up. It was so cool. <laughs> and I do the same thing. A lot of times here in the apartment, I will turn on jungle sounds, you know, on YouTube. And, you know, and people are like, are, are you in the jungle? And I'm like, yeah. You often tell them, I'm in the jungle, baby. I'm going to die. I'm going down. <laughs> You're going down. Uh, Dr. Masters this time is Annie, and uh, she's been taking care of an old woman. And this woman is, uh, her credited name is Grandmother, but uh, she is uh, the Grandma Post. And of course, uh, this makes me think of another film that Lieta and I watch constantly, which is Cold Comfort Farm, mm. which has a character named Miss Post, uh, or Robert Post Child, as the, she's called over and over again in that movie, and it's great. Uh, they don't say Robert Post Child nearly as often as they say Miss Post in this movie. Miss Post. Miss Post. They want this woman's house, the, the grandmother. They want her house, and so they're pulling some shit to get this house. And uh, she's being cared for by Dr. Crother, and uh, this is James N. Harrell, or Harrell. Uh, this guy's in a lot of few, a lot of few. <laughs> He's in a whole bunch of couple things, y'all. <laughs> This guy's real familiar, but he's one of those character actors that is in tons and tons of stuff. He played Cut Right Manager in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Oh, yeah. I mean, I recognized him immediately as Cut Right Manager. I know. We were just talking about it before we started recording. I know. It's MVP of that film, Cut Right Manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'd think it'd be Dennis Hopper, but no. <laughs> no. Uh, so they've been they've been keeping this woman drugged and or poisoned. Uh, because the, the house apparently is very valuable in this small little community here. Annie doesn't feel right about it, so she threatens to call Miss Post. And then uh, she calls Miss Post, and we get uh, uh, Miss Post, played by Susan Bracken, which is an awesome last name. And uh, she was in Not Much, but she was in a movie on TV called Hexaw. Hexaw, which was a family movie, and she played Sue Curtis. Did they say Miss Curtis? Miss Curtis. Miss Curtis. Uh, Tab Hunter was in it. There you go. Ooh. Everyone loves Tab. Very low calories, that Tab Hunter. Yeah, put it on my tab. What do you want? I think I'm going to find a Tab commercial to drop in right here. You know, there's no diet soft drink that has one less calorie than Tab. But there's always water. Tab, 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 so, sorry, I made, I made myself laugh. Uh, so she's checking her awesome answering machine, which uh, this answering machine looks like uh, probably about 80 pounds or something. Yeah, I mean, but who had an answer machine in 1974? Yeah, exactly. I did. Well, yeah, you did, but you're very important. I know. I had so many calls back then before I was a baby. Uh, so she gets the call and being uh, called to go back to Allerton, which is sounds like Allentown to me. I thought that's what they were saying. Ooh. Then Dr. Nick comes in, and I'm going to be very careful which Dr. Nick clip I pick from The Simpsons to drop in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to be the... Call 1-600-DOCTORB! The B is for bargain! <laughs> uh, so her boyfriend comes in. Now, this guy looks a little familiar. He does, doesn't he? It's Hugh Fegan. Good old Hugh Vegan. I know. This guy was in a little film called Don't Look in the Basement and a little film called uh, Poor White Trash 2. Also. And another movie. But we won't talk about that yet. Not yet. No. It wasn't thinking big. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, uh, Nick is her ex-boyfriend, quote unquote, because uh, she's not happy that he's there. It it's very fun. And then uh, she's going to go and uh, rescue her grandma. So she heads off to uh, go do this. And we get the awesome credits, dude. Nick, I'm going to Allerton. My grandmother's very ill. She may be dying. It's been 13 years since I've been there. 13 years. I left when my mother died. My grandma wrote from time to time. And we talked on the phone occasionally. I always told myself she didn't really need me anymore. Now I guess she does. I could never bring myself to go back to that town. And that house. That house of the seasons. Yes. Oh, horror dolls. Horror and dolls go together 
like peas and carrots. I love it. Yep. I just quoted Tom Hanks' famous role, the Christmas movie with the CGI, Train. Train. <laughs> yep. I'm talking about Batman. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm sorry. Tom Hanks was in Batman Begins. My bad. It's cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, and of course we have more great music by Robert Farrar. Where is he now? Um, I presume he's hanging out with Jamie Farrar. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like for him to come over. Yeah, totally. Play us some music. Ooh, he's an English man. Born in uh, East Sussex. Emphasis on the sex. Well, emphasis on the suh. Oh. oh. I can't believe you said that. Well, delete it if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Un- I'll undelete it now. Put some echo on it, I, uh, pff, dude. <laughs> I got your back. I mean, I'm crawling on it because I'm a creepy Whoa. doll. Creepy doll. Creepy doll. Creepy doll. Uh, so we get a flashback, and there's there's a killer. Uh, lurking around in the house. I didn't automatically know this is a flashback. He uh, goes and kind of fondles the kid. It's creepy as shit. Yeah, it is. And then he goes and kills this woman, this this kid's mother. And this, of course, is Miss Post's mother. Uh, Mrs. Post. Mrs. Post. I am so glad that we have speakers that are not attached to our TV because the percussion... This, like, crazy percussion that Robert Farrar did was going to blow up the TV if I had it hooked up that way. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't. Oh, my God. It's so crazy. <laughs> Brown rig! <laughs> like a death metal freaking drummer. It was great. Mom? Uh, 13 years later, uh, Miss Post is uh, showing up in Allerton. So we finally meet the doctor, uh, good old Dr. Crother. And uh, he is really suspicious. Very. <laughs> what do you want a second opinion for? What? And of course, Grandma, we see her. And who is she, Brad? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, she's old cutout tongue lady from Don't Look in the Basement. It's uh, Rhea McAdams. And it was so funny because she was laying down. I didn't recognize her. <laughs> <laughs> she's so full of life and so like crazy. In yeah. Don't Look in the Basement, and when she's completely prone and unconscious, you know, it's like, oh, I, Lieta's like, that's her. I'm like, oh, duh. Question, what, what kind of money do you think Rhea McAdams made for this appearance as Grandmother Post? Well, a lot of the budget was cut to make her paycheck bigger. That's what I was looking for. Boom. Yes. Oh, I thought you were coming to say something. <laughs> Got a cameo by Lieta. Hello, Lieta. Brad says hi. Hi, Brad. Hi there. He said hi there back to you. Uh, we meet the next creepiest person, or the most creepy, the creepy McCreeperson. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kern. Oh, boy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Currently my profile picture on Facebook, because I don't want any friends. <laughs> Dude, that is so amazing. <laughs> if you Google, if you Google search SF Brownrig, his picture comes up. <laughs> but it, it's not him. So this actor, uh, Claude Kern, oh, excuse me, uh, this actor, uh, Larry O'Dwyer, he is amazing. And I can't believe he was never in anything else after this. He's the museum curator in town, which why this town has a museum, I'll never understand. But he wants this house. So he's trying to uh, strike a deal by uh, threatening to blackmail Judge and Dr. Crother, saying that you know, he'll, he'll tell Miss Post what they've been doing to her grandmother. As long as, or he won't if, they let him keep the dolls at the museum. Oh, God. (laughs) They're so cute. Uh, And I wrote in my notes that shit starts getting weird real fast. Yeah. Immediately, this whole conspiracy is suddenly a life and death kind of a thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just a fucking house. Man, I love it. I think even Murder, She Wrote have more stakes than this. Like, there might be buried treasure in the house or something. (laughs) She calls Nick for help, and uh, Nick says, you know, he's a doctor, so he'll rush right in there and see what's going on with Grandma. Then the phone calls start. Oh, my goodness. Now, 
whenever I'm trying to jog Lietta's memory as to what film this is, all I have to say is, Miss Post. And we all get it. And our friend Shelly, who was there the first time we watched it, same thing. Miss Post. You know, because we watched this, like, I don't even know, dude, eight years ago, nine years ago. And it's just such a freaking uh, sticking in your brain performance meets editing meets sound design. Oh, it's great. Mm-hmm. Now, it's a really, they really hide who the caller is really well. Mm, so well that you know immediately. <laughs> it's Mr. Kern. He says Miss Post so many times, I thought it'd be funny to count how many times he said it. Then I went ahead and counted every time that someone said Miss Post in this movie. Do you have a total? I do. Now, there's a moment where it's easy to lose track. So you could skew this with a couple of extra bonus Miss Posts if you wanted to. And uh, I want to. I counted 35 Miss Posts in this movie. Wow. <laughs> That's from wow. every other character, including her boyfriend, who calls her Miss Post at one point. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's like how I wanted to uh, take all the Tomie movies and just edit out the part where someone goes, Tomie! <laughs> but that would take me years. <laughs> It'd take a while. Only nine movies. That's all. I swear, in uh, Tomie versus Tomie, it only gets screamed like that once. And I was like, what? I want my money back. Yeah. From my download. F this. F me in the B. (laughs) (laughs) In the back. got a memory of murder uh we flash back to the flashback and we see uh dead mommy and the zoom in repeat that was like very jess franco-y mm, crash zoom so now we have a scene i love where uh, miss post is taking a bath now what's interesting here is i think this movie for all of its undertone of creepitude has the least nudity of all of the films we're going to talk about. Although, maybe not. Maybe, I'm not sure. Maybe Keep My Grave Open is, hmm, I don't know. Anyway, she's taking a bath and she's reading modern photography. And, of course, it's getting soaked in the bath. I'm like, who does that to a magazine? Uh, I don't know. Nowadays, you'd be reading old-timey photography. <laughs> what? <laughs> they changed the title. Uh, of course, there's a peeper peeping. Oh, the peeper. Can't imagine who that is. Uh, then Mm-mm. doc, then Dr. Nick shows up. Okay. So he shows up and sleeps in another room or goes and stays at the hospital. I forget which to look after grandma. There's a very strange moment while Miss Post is asleep. Um, she's men- she's menaced by a shillelagh. What, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> uh, like there, there's no shillelagh before or after this, <laughs> but it's definitely like a very nice carved wood cane that just, Woo, lifts up her uh, nightdress. Yes. The next morning, she agrees to go see uh, Mr. Kern's uh, museum. He's dying to have her there. And up on the second floor of this museum, which is a hilarious local yokel museum, he has a mannequin of a woman and a mannequin of a younger daughter in this like rustic-looking bedroom. And it's supposed to be Miss Post and her mother. It's honoring her mother, who was murdered. It's great. It is top notch. <laughs> now, why doesn't she like it? I don't... Now, at this point, I would like to say, 
first of all, Miss Post always looks like somebody just farted. <laughs> always. She's uh, just got that that somebody just farted look well, all the time. She is holding her breath to keep from smelling it. That's why she's beat red through the whole movie. Yeah. Oh and God. she's not really overly friendly. When she shows up the first time at the house, she's not diplomatic yeah. at all. She's like, you can all get the hell out of here. <laughs> I'll take care of Grandma. Yeah, she's got a... She's got a tude that I like. I like her attitude. <laughs> I don't think her doctor boyfriend is really a doctor because he tells her, he says, how many of these did you give her? Well, I just gave her one. Something's not right. I don't understand. Well, you're a doctor. <laughs> one what? Well, yeah. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to have to talk to the other doctor and find out what's going on because apparently he's a real doctor. So, but anyway, no, I don't know why, like. She's like, why would you make this of my mother? <laughs> oh, it's she's so snooty. I would love that. She really is. Yeah. <laughs> Things begin to deteriorate very quickly. Uh, the doc shows up at the museum because uh, somebody called him there. And uh, he keeps hearing his name being called uh, further and further upstairs. So he's going upstairs, he's going upstairs. And then it's hammer time, y'all. Hammer time. Mm. So the mannequin sitting in the chair is no longer a mannequin. It is, of course, uh, Mr. Kern in drag, dressed as, I believe, Miss Poe's mother. Right. It's a pretty cool scene. Oh, it's so good. And then uh, mm -hmm. he beats him to death with a hammer. It's great. I mean, beats him to death with a hammer. <laughs> the gore effects are amazing. He hits him like eight times, and there's some ketchupy looking blood on him. Very chilling gore he really knows how to kill efficiently yes boom 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 come into my room i don't know i don't know where i was going with that i just love that mannequin fake out classic at the house miss post is getting further and further uh into this like excited paranoid delusional state and it's the, all these phone calls just phone call after phone call after phone call and eventually she starts to give in which is worse because then she's like, okay, I'll touch myself while you watch. Mr. Kern almost gives himself away. He, I don't know why she didn't pick up on this. Because she's dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he stops with his raspy voice. And then he's just like, oh yeah, thanks, that was awesome. I got him, got to <laughs> masturbate in your wall. Uh -huh. And he just talks like himself for like a good 20, 30 seconds. I'm like, dude, come on. So silly. Judge shows up, and she's had her suspicions about the judge the whole time, so she thinks he's the one doing the phone calls. And the judge, they hear somebody upstairs, so the judge is like, I bet you I know who it is. And I really wish he'd said to her, I think it's Mr. Kern. That would have been very helpful to the to the whole situation. Yeah, or if he'd said... Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, that, or... I mean, you you realize it's Mr. Kern's, right? <laughs> He's in love with you? Like, since you were a 10-year-old kid? The judge probably isn't thinking too straight because uh, he got hit in the head by uh, Mr. Kern, and he was blaming her, and she's blaming him. It's hilarious. It's, it's cock up. So, so, te <laughs> Ooh. so tell your story about how you uh, discerned the, uh, the brutal slang of the judge. It was pretty funny. I've got this uh, download, and I had it hooked my passport up to my Blu-ray player. Now, my Blu-ray player won't play all files, but it was going to play play these, so had it hooked up, but you can't rewind or fast forward. Well, I turned my head. Judge starts going upstairs, and something happened. I don't know. I turned my head, turned it back, and he's been done away with. Well, I can't rewind, so the next day I had to hook it up to my computer, and I'm, I didn't miss anything. He goes upstairs. He's coming down the hallway. Mr. Kern sneaks out behind him with a knife, and then you cut to the judge coming back down the stairs, and he falls over dead. I don't, you missed the whole thing when the gargoyle broke out of the, the floor and, and mm. ripped his face off and then put it back on him. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that cut. Oh, you, yeah, that's right. You have the censored version. <laughs> After the judge is killed, Miss Post loses her shiitake mushrooms. Boy, howdy. Holy shit, man. It's so good. So Nick shows up trying to reason with her and it don't go so good. And uh, she grabs the nearest mannequin arm. Yes. And beats him. 
Oh, man. And he falls. Because, of course, the reason this movie, I believe, was called House of the Seasons is that this house, Miss Post's house, has this awesome attic room. E- each side of the room has a different color. To the, the, the glass has been colored different colors, and it's very atmospheric, very beautiful. That's where, that's where poor Dr. Nick uh, meets his end. And then, of course, the phone calls start up right again. And uh, yeah. it, in my favorite badass, though, she's totally insane now from this whole experience. My favorite badass moment is when he's like, Miss Post, Miss Post. And she's like, yeah, click. <laughs> <laughs> is this what he wanted? He wanted a driver crazy? Uh, and that's that's the whole plot of the movie. That's it, with, right there. With, Little things skipped, but not much. It's uh, not much. Very small movie. Like all these movies are small movies, but this one I think is his most. God, I dare say biggest budget. Uh, probably had more than one location. You know. <laughs> well, a few things. One, he he should have beat the editor, whoever edited this film, because there's a few shots that have style and they just abruptly end. There's a shot where they're looking up the stairwell. It's a circular stairwell. Big, nice, big, spacious. And it just cuts. There's some nice camera moves in this. Colors, like you said, in the in the room of all seasons, really add some nice atmosphere. I can't help but be drawn to the similarities to Black Christmas, which is the same year. There's the telephone calls. There's the, yeah, we're pretty sure we've killed the killer. Or the... <laughs> At least the uh, the protagonist is, but the calls continue. Of course. The only thing that I don't care for is that it, when we sum up all of his films, I'll, I'll bring up a point, but it, it's pretty obvious from the jump because you can see who's on the phone in the dark. Mm-hmm. So that robs it of a little bit of suspense. Now, you would certainly suspect Mr. Kearns, but there's no need for you to waste your s- suspicion <laughs> because it's clear <laughs> that it's him. I think this film represents a a pretty good sized jump in filmmaking techniques from the previous two. Totally. Uh I think he is starting to really get a handle on making a movie. Well, I think this editor is really going to have our way with us uh for the next film cuz he also edited this Don't Look in the Basement and Keep My Grave Open, so Really? Yeah, he also edited uh, Return to Boggy Creek. No way. I still haven't seen that. Now, is that is that the Pierce second one, or is it the other second one? Because you, as we have established that uh, S.F. Brownrigg is the poor man's, poor man's Charles B. Pierce. Yeah. Uh, nope, this is Tom Moore's film. Okay. That is not worth watching. Oh. Charles B. Pierce's second Boggy Creek film is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And I, highly, I highly recommend seeing that one. Because he stars in it, old Spark Plug himself, Sparky, uh, in a pair of cutoff jeans. Oh, oh, Doctor. I'm excited. I think I've said enough already. <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, what's interesting here is, speaking of the crew, uh, I, finally got that, I finally got that common cast and crew thing to work. And between, oh, good. between this and uh, Don't Look in the Basement, this had 14 returning cast and crew. Wow. Oh my god, there were more, there's more than one editor on this film, dude. Are you serious? No. I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> the cuckoo clock threw me off. <laughs> okay, so this editor who also worked on this film, this is Lynn Linnea Combs. She worked on uh, Don't Look in the Basement, Keep My Grave Open, which explains further insanity there. She also edited The Nail Gun Massacre. Wow. Oh my god. <laughs> what? It's a spooky old night in the living room. <laughs> it's a relaxing <laughs> night. She's coming down off of a hard day. Oh, good. Um, so, Brad, what do you, I mean, how do you like this one? I do like this one quite a bit. I think it's, uh, this is not a movie you're going to go and rave about to just anybody. This is a movie <laughs> that you were going to rave about to me and that I'm going to rave about to you or David Ladd or Simon because there is a lot to love here. Objectively, it's probably not a good film objectively, but the fact that you had already seen it like eight years ago and the Miss Post, it's just, again, I have to say, it's got a lot of charm to it. Like they're, you know, seeing like Gene Ross in all these movies and his differing hair, you know, (laughs) he plays a redneck, he plays a judge, he plays a judge, 
he plays a psychiatrist. Uh, the SF Brown Rig Repertory Theater is has got a fan in me. I think this. I mean, it's a and it's a total proto slasher. You know, if we're if we're saying anything before, uh, typically what I go by is if it's before Halloween, it's a proto slasher. I think it's a lot of fun. the The copy that I saw was pretty decent. You can tell what's going on real really well. I I can't say the same for keep my grave open. Oh, sadly, boy. yeah, we're in for a treat there. I think that he is definitely improving as a director. One of the reasons why this looks so good is because of the film stock and the uh, color palette. Like, Mm -hmm. this is some sharp, bright, high contrast business. There's so much style in this movie. It's dripping with color. Even Miss Post is bright and colorful. Everything (laughs) is like 70s with like Pepto Bismol pinks everywhere. Um, the whole sequence, any of the parts that happen up in the uh, that attic room with all the different colored lights, all the different colored windows is gorgeous. Um, the actors are giving it their all again, like again and again. You see these people. Yes. I mean, even if you don't like Miss Post, the actress is selling it, and I don't mean her sex vagina. No. I've got a question for you. Sure. So when Mr. Kearns goes to see the judge, he goes in and he looks around and he's like, this is really nice. And the judge says, don't get any ideas. <laughs> what is that about? Like, is he afraid he'll try to steal the train car? Yeah, he'll try to add it to the museum. Add it to the museum. It'll be the annex for the museum. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, the museum, th- that whole business doesn't make a lick of sense. I mean, is that his job? What does that pay? It's just dolls. It depends on donations from the the town, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just so bizarre because that is, his motive is twofold. Obviously, he's in creepy love with this kid, Miss Post, but also he doesn't want her taking, I, I guess this is the Post family doll collection, I guess. I guess. Uh, yeah. Am I reading that wrong? I or? have no idea. That's okay. perfectly reasonable. I thought it was just all about the house. It's a hell of a fun film, I think. Oh, yeah. And I think the reason, because this is such an actorly movie, I think that's why we see uh, Mr. Kearns, uh, that actor, hiding and making those calls is because it's an awesome performance. SF Brownrig and company could not help but show it because it's so good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they literally couldn't wait to show him making these creepy calls because it's very effective. It ruins the mystery, but what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I'm sure that access to this house was reason enough to make a film. Totally. Oh, man. No you know? Let's see. Uh, I also love the great music from Farrar. Uh, I love the Alice in Wonderland name drop in there. It's great. It just adds a little uh, a tweak of uh, subtext to this movie. Uh, the paranoia, the perversity... Just the whole thing is just a wonderful aesthetic. I mean, yeah, I am really, really glad I returned to this. And this is something that just, oh, man, it's, uh, I love it. I tell you, watching these films for this, this episode has been a lot of fun. And I think that uh, Elizabeth has enjoyed it as well. All right. Um, if you are ready, let's move on to, uh, absolutely keep my grave open or with my horrible handwriting, it's keep my grave open. Mm. So no trailer for keep my grave open, sadly. Uh, but I'll drop a little, uh, music from the film right here again. Mr. Uh, Farrar has returned. I have this on an Alpha Video DVD. Now, it's important to note it's a DVD plus R. Alpha Video, at least unless they have a whole group of people that have chosen to ruin them by releasing inferior products, 
This is a double feature. Keep my grave open with Beast of the Yellow Knight. Ooh. I took it out and I flipped it over and immediately saw it was a DVD R. I was like, oh, great. This is, <laughs> this is, this is not what I was expecting. So uh, Alpha Video, I don't know if you could ever call them the sign of quality. I mean, obviously, VCI Entertainment, the V is for quality. Exactly. Uh, but uh, Alpha Video, they were a great way to discover things, but they're not exactly uh, – archival source of movies <laughs> they're not putting out collectors no. special editions no sir it's uh what rod calls alpha video rod from the nash cast alpha video all the quality you could fit into nothing <laughs> i think that's what he said perfect what i love about this is dvd plus r's they don't play on my dvd player why i don't know they play on my blu-ray player so i actually got to watch Keep my grave open on my Blu-ray player. That was funny. Nice. And of course, it looked like the VHS rip that everyone has. Yes. So if you're watching this movie and you're thinking, man, I wish there was a better copy, eh, keep waiting. Yeah, there ain't one. Man, let's see. Until like... until Criterion releases the SF Proud Recollection. <laughs> they will be inspired by our show to do that. I hope so. Woo-hoo. This was uh, filmed in Harrison County, Texas. And uh, it has many multiple, t- many multiple. It has uh, at least one other really cool title that I love. Uh, the House Where Hell Froze Over. Yes. And uh, like Brad dropped on us earlier, all these films were filmed around the same two-year period. This did not come out until 76 or 77. When I was looking for 1976 movies, this kept coming up. And the further I looked into it, the less I found that was anything 1976-y about it. All right, so this film uh, begins with uh, a uh, truck going down the road with some nice, uh, it's like an acoustic guitar and piano kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Got a hitchhiker, very large gentleman. In my notes, I refer to him as the king of the road. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That's a song that's on our mix in our car all the time. So he gets to the house, he gets dropped off by his ride, and we see this big, giant house in the background, and it has a very interesting uh, no trespassing sign. It says, uh, keep out, uh, we are not responsible for any accidents, which, um, hmm, hmm, what? Yeah. Seems oddly specific. Doesn't it? Uh, he goes into this creepy house, you know, not heeding this warning, and immediately raids the fridge. <laughs> yeah, like you do. <laughs> uh, you steal the steaks. Steal the wine, man. You leave that uh, that old tab cola right there because that is not tasting too good. Uh, so he goes camping and he's he's sitting out in the middle of uh, the woods, enjoying the fruits of his labors and labors. I mean, robbing those people. Right. Then uh, a person walks up behind him, and it's uh, a person carrying a large sword. And uh, right when this this guy's killed, we cut to a butcher shop. Pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. That's very nice. And that's when we meet Miss Leslie Fontaine. Mm -hmm. And uh, Camilla Carr is back with us. She, of course, uh, was good old Harriet in uh, Don't Look in the Basement. And she was Sarah. Country hooker. Oh, man. Only a dollar. And that's for a couple of your friends, too. Exactly. Buy your own periodicals, Junior. I love sharing a woman. (laughs) <laughs> thank you for laughing you're, at that yeah, you're so gracious <laughs> magnanimous <laughs> oh, you cracked me up oh doctor so she's in the uh, this uh, butcher shop slash uh, little uh, shop here and uh, she, she buys a, a, a pipe and oh you know what there's an old lady in there uh huh. In the store, did you recognize that old lady? Is she the nurse from the beginning of Don't Look in the Basement? Yep, that's Janie, the uh, nurse. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, I already forgot her name. <laughs> it's been so many years since we talked about these things. Oh, no. Well, no. Earlier tonight. <laughs> there she is. Okay. It's uh, it's good old Leslie. Oh, God. It's good old Jesse <laughs> Lee Fulton. Yep, she's there. She does not. Uh, really do anything, but she's there. She's there. For all Part you, of the SF Brown Rick repertory players. Yeah, for all you Jesse Lee Fulton completists, boom. Uh, Miss Fontaine, or uh, good old uh, Leslie, buys a pipe. She's going to put some uh, crack in it later. It's going to be awesome. Crack. 
And then while she's driving across town, who should show up but good old Gene Ross? Dependable. Man, he's playing Dr. Emerson, and his music cue when he shows up is so awesome! Man, Farrar's like, I got this old thing I made. Do you want it? And SF Brown Riggs said, I don't want to hear it. Give it to the editors. It's <laughs> whatever it is, it's perfect. Leslie goes home and she's running around going, Kevin, Kevin. And I'm like, who's Kevin? Where's Kevin? What's Kevin? Who's Kevin? Jeez. We need to talk about Kevin. Dude, when you texted me that, I was like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about Kevin. Mm-hmm. Man. Okay, so now we get Bobby. Who shows up and Bobby loves wearing uh, those uh, denim jackets with the fur collars. You called this out. I did not recognize this young man at all. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, I think on Hello, This is the Doom Show, Stephen Tobolowski. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Character actor from 255 films and counting. First appearance in a film. Man, what? The hell. I'm so glad he showed up in Atlas Shrugged. Who is John Galt? And uh -huh. yeah. Ooh, he was on the Rita Rocks TV series. How much hair does he have back then? Oh, in this? Luscious. Yes. I know. Lots beautiful. Of luscious. Yeah. It's in his contract. He has to shave his head every time he's in a movie now. Crazy. Just like Vin Diesel. He is, ugh. <laughs> he's not the only famous person making their debut in this film. We'll get there. Oh, my God. Dude, I'm excited. He he loves calf roping and he's uh, a uh, a stable hand, horsey mm -hmm. hand, horseman. I don't know, cowboy. Oh, right, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> he is trying to train uh, Leslie's horse uh, to uh, stomp on little calves or whatever they do. I think they're trying to teach it to uh, to find landmines. Oh my god, that is very useful, especially in the Vietnam War. Uh, that's when Emmy shows up. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. It is, it's Emmy from, uh, good old, uh, Poor White Trash 2. This is Anne Stanford. And she's playing Susie. And, uh, Susie is very into Bobby, but I don't think Bobby is so into Susie. Doesn't seem that way. Oh, oh my god. He's a fool. He's a damn fool, because she is so cute. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And then something amazing happens. Back at the house, Leslie screams, Why won't you just love me? Why don't you just love me? It's great. And what do you say to that? I, I say, do. I'll be right over. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Hold that Ooh. thought. Yeah, Camilla Carr looking really good, especially with her awesome yes. bowl cut. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, so cute. All of a sudden, Kevin, uh, this unseen gentle man, uh, decides to go after Susie in an awesome stalking sequence. Oh, it's such a good stalking sequence. I love it. Uh, she's in a barn <laughs> waiting for Bobby. This mysterious Kevin character uh, brings his sword, his, uh, his rapier from the, uh, I'm assuming, from the Confederate Army or some shit. And he's running around, banging on the frickin' walls, and finally, uh, using the old Kentucky stabbing someone through the door jam trick. Yeah, it's an old one. Takes her out. That's, man, that's, yeah. your family started doing that in the 1880s. Yeah, we call that, that little maneuver, the South will rise again. <laughs> it's about heritage, not hate, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my neighbors are assholes. Anyway, have I mentioned on this episode already that they have a Confederate flag up? Or is that is that with Jeffrey? I don't remember. No, you haven't. I'm going to keep uh, outing these people next door to me. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't, ha I don't have any problem with it for like old timers, but like if you're, if you're flying it outside, you're just, you're just inviting trouble. Yep. You know? <sighs> it's America, so I literally can't stop them. <laughs> no. And, you know, I grew up loving the General Lee that has, you know, the Confederate battle flag painted yep. on top of it. It was you know? it was born to be loved, that car. 
Yes. But it takes on, I mean, you just gotta, I'm not against it, but you also, in today's day and age, you need to try to be more sensitive. Yep. Today's sensitivity lesson is brought to you by Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone. <laughs> brought to you by the old Kentucky stabbing people <laughs> through the door jam trick, a.k.a. The South will rise again. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. After he murders Susie, which is so sad, carefully cleans his sword off on the body like you do. Mm-hmm. And then um, the doctor calls, good old Doc Emerson calls Leslie uh, to strongly encourage her to go back to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And Great toupees wearing, by the way. Oh, my God. He's looking good. Looking good. He's like, he you is. know what? I'm not bald anymore. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> and then we have the makeup sequence, which is great. Oh, yes. Oh, how much makeup can a woman wear? The answer is here in this film, 25 pounds on her face. Yes, and I tell you, she changes her appearance a couple times in this Shit. film. And in this particular sequence, I thought about how unlucky we are that we did not get a Camilla Carr as a vampire in the 70s Ooh, film. Yeah. I thought she, she, yeah, I think she did really well. Dude, she could have flown to Europe and been in Vampires with a Y. Yes. Good old Raz. Yes. Or yes. she could have yes. been uh, in uh, freaking Daughters of Darkness. Yep, that's what I was thinking, Daughters of Darkness. Perfect. They would have been like, yeah. hey, you're really subtle as an actress, right? And she'd be like, yeah, dude. <laughs> I know that you've seen the SF Brown Rig blockbusters <laughs> over here. Hello. Oh, yes. This is indeed a blockbuster. <laughs> mm. yeah. So then she puts on a black nightgown, and I'm like, what, is she going to the stock of the graveyard like a vampire? Yes. We're on the same page. Then, oh, then the POV sex scene happens. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. This is so awesome. I love it. Uh, so the camera is, is basically making sweet, sweet love. They're making the sex act. And uh, yeah. then with all us, the, with us, with us, with you know, we're having sex with Camilla Carr. It's great, great scene. Mm-hmm. All yeah. of a sudden, it backs up. It is like cock tease, boom, I'm out of here, and she's freaking out. It's great. And then Bobby shows up. <laughs> oh dear, Bobby! Oh my god, dude, he he, the, <laughs> he looks so terrified. She basically, uh, much like Kevin, is vagina blocking her. She cock blocked. Bobby and told his grandma or somebody that uh, he can't calf rope anymore with her horse. So he's all fired up. He comes over and all of that fire gets immediately drained away when she shows up like the uh, Avon lady gone insane. (laughs) Oh, and so she basically says, how bad do you want to ride that horse? And he says, I don't know. Do I have to ride you like a horse, (laughs) ma'am? She says, yeah, dude. Get on this shit. He says, oh, yeah. So she takes Bobby upstairs. <laughs> right. He has a little aside. He's like, okay, I'm going to do this for the horse. <laughs> what the fuck? I love that <laughs> usually these movies are populated with overly sexed people, not someone who spends their days avoiding sex. No. It's, I'm doing this for the horse. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Whew. Okay. She says she's going to take a shower, and uh, he goes up to to get showered on, assuming goldenly, and then he gets killed, and the movie breaks completely. Broken. Uh, okay, folks, this movie is uh, 78 minutes or less? One hour, 19 minutes. It feels like something is missing. It does. Man. There may be. Yeah. For real. Oh, I cannot wait until one day this finally shows up, not VHS rip crapola. Yes, this is definitely, well, we'll get to that, but this is definitely the, the, the hardest to watch as far as visually yep. of the four. Whereas Poor White Trash 2 is the hardest to watch because of all the sweating and the incest. Right, and the rape. Oh, whoops. Then it's it's hooker time. <laughs> I love and it. it to, to oh. This ha- okay. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I've got a. I've got a. I, obviously, <laughs> I'm, the film is not the only thing that's broken here. I've got a. <laughs> I've got a question, okay. and perhaps you can answer it. Goes to the local bar uh, where it is 
completely openly legalized prostitution or some shit is going on. Uh, she right. approaches a, a, a madam. And of course, mm-hmm. uh, this is good old Annabelle Weenick. Uh huh. Again, this right. time she is playing someone named Clara and she's, uh, in charge of all these girls. She's their lady pimp or just right. Mr. Lady Pimp. Uh, it's something. I don't know how the specifics of Hooker and works yep. exactly. Um, it's all free. They're just horny mm. ladies and men. Mm. She wants to hire a prostitute for Kevin, presumably. Right. She gets Twinkle. <laughs> but she knows, she calls Twinkle by, I mean, she knows Twinkle. Yeah. How? Or she knows enough to ask for Twinkle. I don't I, know. Okay, so Twinkle is played by Sharon Bunn, and um, she's, in my mind, a super sexy lady. I was like, right. man, this is great. If I'm going to go get a hooker, it's going to be a Twinkle. Exactly. And not a Twink, because that's a young gay man. No. That's right. You do a little tinkle before you do the Twinkle. <laughs> <laughs> and then you wink to get a Twink. That's right. Possibly. Maybe. That's what I've heard from my sources. We're st- <laughs> I'm still waiting for my grandma's prophecy to come true that I'm gay, so we'll see what happens. Well, the clock's ticking, Grandma. Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> this whole sequence is great. This like weird logic that's going on is awesome. Uh, she takes Twinkle back to the house, and uh, Twinkle's like, well... I don't do girls. And she's like, no, I'm getting my brother. I'm getting my brother. Okay. Just what kind of a game is this? I ain't a freak, you know. No. No. And I don't go in for that three-way business either. Neither do I. <sighs> Look, I already told you. Not with women either. So sure enough, we see good old Leslie is Kevin. She gets all dressed up like a man. And she comes in and an awesome fight ensues. Twinkle is... All too familiar with the old, my brother is a figment of my imagination, I'm going to kill you thing that happens to hookers all the time. Because oh. <laughs> she puts up a good fight. It's awesome. Uh, oh, man. Yep. Of course, she doesn't get away. No. No, she gets murdered. Murdered. Oh, it's so great. My notes stop at some point here. Right here, right. in fact. <laughs> no, oh shit, the suicide. Why did I stop taking notes? Good lord, I'm such a moron. Anyway. Uh, the doctor is really worried about good old Leslie. He wants to take her back to the hospital. She decides to take her pills, overdose, but she drops the glass bottle in the frickin' uh, sink, and she takes a fistful of pills and broken glass and dies. Then they have her funeral, and who shows up after the funeral, y'all? Kevin. Kevin. Yep. The real live Kevin. Yes, played by uh oh my god. What? Chelsea in his first, Ross. In his first film appearance. What the fuck? Eighty eight credits and counting. That is and so you know, funny. You know this dude. He's You've seen in him. everything. Just like Toblowski. Shit. That is so funny. Oh my god. <laughs> In the credits, they spell his name like you would spell a girl's name, Chelsea. Right, but so it's confusing it's, because yes, because of course it's a weirdly it's a weird spelling normally. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's so funny. So he shows up and he's like, "Man, I can't believe she made me. She left me all these bodies to bury." And yeah. So dun dun dun. There's a real Kevin confusing me. He goes back in the house, and it's a replay of the opening scene. Well, not the opening scene, but the first scene with her. He's talking to her upstairs. She's upstairs. You don't see her. So, obviously, he's crazy the same way she is? Yeah, what? The least you could have done was bury them for me. I have. I know you have a question for me, but I have a question for you. Okay. My question for you is, what is Kevin's relationship to Leslie? My thought is, is that they really are brother and sister and perhaps lovers as well. And that the doctor, it, the doctor didn't know. I don't think the doctor knew that Kevin was a real person. Exactly. So somehow they've been separated 
and oh, he got a call from the public. Calls, calls, calls. Hello, Miss Post. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I want to talk to Kevin. <laughs> we need to talk about Kevin. <laughs> Yeah, so that's my thought. I think that they, you know, somehow they've been separated for a little while, and they're both crazy. Now, Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, what? And I told her, and she's like, you've stymied me, brown rig. <laughs> the reason I'm confused, the reason I'm asking, is I thought they were brother and sister the whole time. But, here's the weird thing. During her conversation with Dr. Emerson, I misheard or heard her say, there I was with two sets of coffins, and then my old aunt had to take care of me, and Kevin. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> what? The, oh, was Kevin her cousin? What? Maybe. I miss. I may have misheard that line completely. The, she goes through the, they go through the whole history in one of their outdoor sessions. Yeah. It's Maybe it's her parents. Maybe it's her parents that are in the coffins. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But it was, I got really confused. Well, because the, the at the top of IMDb, it says a crazy woman who lives in an old mansion thinks she's with her brother slash lover who lures victims to her. Ah, okay. Which is just that's the movie in a nutshell. Yeah. So that's that's not that cool, really. I like I like to overthink it. No, not at all. My question is basically what your question was. Okay. <laughs> I wanted your take on it. Yeah. I think that they've just been separated somehow, and she's just continued. Obviously, living with the old aunt, her parents dead, has has created some issues. Yep. But here's the thing. Except for Poor White Trash, the other three films are pretty cliched situations. If you've seen five movies, you know that the patients are running the asylum. Yep. The calls are coming from inside the house. Yep. And Kevin does not exist. Yep. Except at the end, he does exist. <laughs> Which is a nice little tag for the end of it. Yeah. It really raises the film a bit higher on the memorable level. Oh, man. I think this one, Keep My Grave Open, is the most Laraz like film. I said on Facebook that it was not in the same league at all, but somewhat akin to Symptoms. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I would love to see just a better copy. It doesn't have to be HD. Uh, it could be just standard definition DVD yeah, of this. It's, it's dark and like it's just not as easy to see. I think that Camilla Carr does a great job. Oh, man. You've got Stephen Tobolowsky. You've got Chelsea Ross, both in their first film appearances. And that is what there is a, a horrorpedia article written by Stephen Thrower. Yeah. I'm glad you found that. About, yeah, about this film. And he says... He made the four films between 72 and 74, and Chelsea Ross, who plays Kevin, left Texas in 1975, so that puts a definitive outer limit on the possible shooting date of the film. Right. But to think that he made all four of these in two years Man. is really quite an accomplishment. I also wonder why he stopped. Oh, boy. You know? Yeah. You know, if Stephen Thrower is writing a, a pretty good-sized article review on the film then there's obviously some critical merit to it i think absolutely i think that proves it oh even if he didn't say anything you know what i mean like <laughs> it's worth oh it's yeah worth examining exactly. completely. because i was confused when i went through my nightmare usa book there he mentions sf brown rig about four or five times in the book mm -hmm. and usually it's because the proximity to another filmmaker mm -hmm. or similar cast and crew or something. I was really surprised mm. there wasn't an SF Brown rig piece in there, like something about all these films. He'd already written about that in Horrorpedia, Horrorpedia which I'm glad you found. I'm hoping that there's going to be a Nightmare USA 2 or something where he... He definitely writes about some films in Nightmare USA that I don't think merit the same quality. Oh, God, the strangeness. These films are exactly the sort of thing that I like about American regional horror films totally, of the 70s. Totally. I love the proto-slasher moments in this. Uh, they're even oh, yes. more pronounced here than any of the other films. You know, if this had come out in 79, it would have been freaking just another slasher. It'd be great. The cuts in this, the editing is really solid. Uh, Whatever is missing from the film, God only knows why it's missing. Farrar is back with an awesome score. 
I love the fuzz guitar and all the melodramatic piano. Oh, there's a spaghetti western theme when, oh, he, when yeah. Bobby's riding the horse, and you cannot you cannot deny <laughs> that that is not somebody straight up ripping off Morricone. Totally, because it, it's a spaghetti, it's a spaghetti western theme. Oh yeah, I love it. One thing I, th- I found really interesting, and this is just my take on it, if you had a sex scene in this movie, like a, a more explicit sex scene and a relatively explicit uh, female masturbation scene, then this would be Jess Franco's American film. Yes, I agree 100%. With the caveat that instead of a creepy aunt who raised her, it was a creepy uncle, and we'd have a flashback to Jess Franco as that creepy uncle raping that character. And that character <laughs> would have pigtails so that we'd know that she was a young person. That's right. And there'd be <laughs> fake slow motion, like in that one Jess Franco film. Have you seen that? I thought that? you were going to say, uh-uh. Look up Jess Franco fake slow motion. It is so funny. They didn't want to undercrank the camera or overcrank the camera to get that slow-mo. So they just, nice. oh, I'm in slow-mo. It's so amazing. <laughs> wow. 200 films, everybody. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Howard Vernon would play. Howard Orlov. Vernon would play uh, the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. <Doctor> Orlov. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't think of that. Thank you. That was great. Gene Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, Gene Ross is the only one that appears on screen at all four. All four of them, yes, sir. And I do like, uh, he's a good actor. Yeah, he is really cool. He had a he had an okay career. He's in a bunch of things. Fegan was in three of the four. Yeah. So I have a couple of things okay. that I want to talk about before we wrap this up or even begin to try to wrap our minds around what we've just been through. Okay. We're going to need Dr. Emerson to talk us through this. S.F. Brownrigg has several children, at least two sons. Okay. And one of them is a sound man. Just like S.F. Brownrigg was a sound guy for a brief time. His other son is a filmmaker. And his other his son made the sequel, uh, Don't Look in the Basement 2, in 2016. It's Tony Brownrigg. Okay. And uh, Camilla Carr is, is in it. As she's uh, uh-huh. playing somebody in it. Now, I haven't seen this film. I'd like to. Yeah, I would absolutely watch this. I think it's a Blu-ray with this and the original. Uh, there was something else that he did that looked relatively interesting. Um, he did a film called Red Victoria. He plays a writer named Jim who's uh, trying to write a horror movie, and a woman, a, a ghost, tries to help him write the movie. Interesting. Yeah, it looked pretty cool. I remember the trailers. It was a few years before he did the the sequel. Seems interesting. It's funny you say you said that about him being a sound guy. I think there's some parallels there to. Charles B. Pierce was a set a set decorator, and of course, I think that you know my uber fondness for Charles B. Pierce. <laughs> uh, I'm actually one of the 14 people that like his uh, his Facebook page, so periodically I get Charles B. Pierce updates. Stacy Brownrigg is his other son, and he's in. Mm. Uh, he's the sound guy. He's been in. He's been working very steadily for many many years. That's great. Yeah, he was a. Uh, Wow, remake king here. He did the remake of The Hitcher, the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the remake, the Friday the 13th remake. Wow. That's awesome. (laughs) Oh, and he also worked on Walker, Texas Ranger. Hell yes. Oh my goodness. That's everybody's favorite show. Uh, You know, one of my funniest, the funniest jokes in the Zeppo episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is Xander-centric. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> they are raising zomb- zombies, like their their friends that have died recently. Yeah. And uh, the big football dude is raised from the dead. And he's like, dude, you been taping Walker, Texas Ranger for me? <laughs> and so I think of that every time. Oh, uh, anyone... that's awesome. <laughs> and in, in my life, well, Walker, Texas Ranger gets referenced a lot in just daily conversations. Of course. It's a uh, Bowling Green tradition. That's right. So the other thing that we need to talk about, the horrible thing in the uh in the room it's not an elephant elephant would be pleasant uh this is more like a a syphilated uh, hippo or something oh goodness there's a film called thinking big it is 
S.F. Brownrigg's last credit as a director. Whatever happened to his career, it got completely derailed. And from 70, early 70s through the early 80s, nothing. Mm -mm. And then he made a film called Thinkin' Big. And I tried, I tried to watch it. Oh my god. So... I'm going to play a little clip right from the beginning of what I thought this film was going to be. So here's this clip. Hi, I'm Bud. And I'm Morgan. We met on the beach last year before I struck it rich. And Morgan's going to help me tell my story. The only reason I agreed to do this is to make sure that the people hear the true story. You know, being a big thinker takes a lot of hard work and discipline. But let me tell you, the rewards are worth it. You? A big thinker? Huh. You lucked into every red cent you own. You're supposed to be helping me here. Well, the whole thing was disgusting. Disgusting. You know it. Yes, it was humiliating. It was revolting. It was disgusting. <laughs> you see, the only reason I was involved in this at all was to get my first <laughs> lick at the ocean. Oh, are you kidding? You just wanted to get away from your mother. Now, what that is, is two silly characters being introduced in a very kooky but cute way. So you get an idea of what the movie's going to be about. This movie is terrifyingly wrong-headed <laughs> in all sense of the word. Okay, so it's basically a bunch of good-time guys. I will not call them good-time Charlies, ever. And a bunch right. of good-time gals. And they go off to the beach during the winter to meet dudes and meet chicks okay. and hook up. But they're at the right. beach... In the winter, and no one's there. And these two no. camps of morons meet up. Comedic things happen. And I was so enraged by the first half hour of the movie that I skipped to the end. And at the end of the movie, the narrator, who is also not the narrator, because there's like two narrators. The guy who's not the narrator, who's the narrator, is just having sex with all these women because he's a millionaire now. And I just ba I had to bail. I'm like, nope, I can't do this. Oh, I didn't even try, dude. Because you told me not to. It is really depressing. Like I like a quirky movie. I like kooky shit. I mean, I'm like I love the Mutilator. You know, right. I love Nightmare Weekend. I love those things because they have this weird charm to them. This has no charm. I would call this movie quaintly racist if it was just for the <laughs> Asian character. The Asian character oh, no. makes fun of himself. Like he speaks normal. But then he goes into his ancient Chinese secret voice, like really like delivering these horrible sayings and everything. But then they run into a Mexican. Uh oh. And they completely make fun of Mexicans for a, this big old joke in the movie. And I was so fucking angry. I was like, this is horrible. Then you have the guys who are just walking hard ons. And I'm like, ugh. And it's so sleazy. Luckily, the girls are also equally horny, but there's just endless breasts. Like these actresses have to show their boobs to continue working in the film. And it's so I'm like, oh God. Fart jokes, there's a there's a giant dick joke. And this is this is all in the first half hour of the movie. Wow. They make fun of fat people endlessly, because of course Pud, the the who I thought was the main character, who isn't the main character, who's the narrator narrator, but also isn't the narrator. He gets made fun right. of for being fat all the time. And it's oh God. Terrible. Man, it is a demoralizing end to a very promising career. Ugh. And according to uh, the VCI disc, the the bio they had on him, when he passed away in '96, he had lots and lots of projects completely unrealized scripts. So and, sad. Yeah. Luckily, no one remembers Thinking Big. Nobody gives a shit about it. It's on YouTube if you want to look. It's Thinking Big, 1986. See how far you can get into it, because. <laughs> That's like when you're really enjoying a horror movie and then it turns into the sexy horror movie and you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, Get care, me out yeah. of here. Mm. We're probably the only podcast to cover all four. I'm, I'm sure somebody's done a don't open the door, don't uh, look in the basement double feature. But yeah, I think we did, uh, I think we did a uh, good thing here. Profondo Cinema, oddly enough, they covered don't look in the basement cool. paired with something else. It wasn't a brown rig. Ah. I don't remember what it was. If you can find, uh, go to Horrorpedia. Ah. Ah. Find those articles by Stephen Thrower. They're really, really good, and they're really super informative, even down to the locations and everything. So check those out. Heck yeah. No, I thought that it was a, it was a nice little 
Nice little article. And, he, and of course, he's a British man, so he's more eloquent than us. He's probably got a better insight into the American psyche. And into the English language, y'all. <laughs> Actually, all, every sentence in his article ends with y'all. It was really weird. I was like, Stephen, throw well, what's going on, bro? The, the Final Terror and Don't Look in the Basement, episode 186. Oh, nice. That's a great double feature. The Final Terror, is that the woodsy slasher one? It is indeed. I've still never seen that. Still never seen it. I have seen it. Mm. It's uh, got Joey Pants in it. Who? Joe Pantalolino, the guy from The Matrix and Risky Business. Oh. I believe he's in it. <laughs> Daryl Hannah. That's right. Is it just me or is Don't Open the Door? Shouldn't that have been called Don't Answer the Phone? But what's funny is the reason it wasn't called that is because there was already a film called that. Called that. Called that. Mm-hmm. Where was Mr. Kearns? Like, was he just in the next room? I, I never understood spatially where he was. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, okay. I'm looking at the VHS box of Don't Open the Door, and I'm trying to find... Okay, it was released in 1985 by Hollywood Video Gems. Mm. Let's see if they have a listing. I want to see if they're anywhere. Nope. Oh, well, I tried. I couldn't find any, uh, like, distribution company for Don't Open the Door. Like, what VHS company put it out. And also, click, you know, clickety-clackety, clickety-clackety. Clickety-clackety. It's just amazing that uh, we had talked about this a long time ago, and I went to Vermont, uh, sat in a hotel room, and watched all four of these on my iPad. My old iPad, uh, I had loaded them up, and it was January 2014. <laughs> <laughs> and then three years later, we did it. Three years later, we did it. Awesome. Uh, Brad, thank you so much for going through this with me. This is great. It was my pleasure, sir. Man. Uh, and folks, thank you for listening. Uh, we will be back with probably something less uh, complicated, at least in terms of sweating and shouting. But it could be. And uh, Miss Post. Miss Post. Miss Post. <laughs> <laughs> If they knew what they were doing, it would have been poor white trash also. <laughs> poor white trash, indeed. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. Hello, this is the Doom Show, is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other shows at legionpodcasts.com. If you want more of Hello, This is the Doom Show, check out doomedmoviethon.com or hellodoomedshow.podomatic.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at doomedmoviethon or email the show doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. We're also in the air. Look up. All right, all right. Welcome to the Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast. Oh, Dave, episode Dave. Oh, what? the phone there, man. This isn't a show. It's a promo. Oh, sorry. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Wait, a, a porno? With just the three of us? Oh. Well, I guess I'm game if you guys are. No, no, no you idiot. A promo. Oh, promo. I, I knew that. I was just cracking wise. Okay, can we do this now? Ah, wait, looks like I lost my notes. What are we gonna do? Of course, okay, look, I'll, I'll handle this. All right, everybody, I'm Christian. You may know me from TJF13, this guy over here. That's Dave Z. You may know him from Banana Laser, The Skeleton Crew, the ABCs of Hidden Horror, and this guy, this guy over here, that's Brandon. That's Brandon? That's it? That sucks, man. Yeah, what the hell's with that? There's nothing else you can say? No, not really. Well, he's quick with a joke. Or a light of your smoke. Ugh. But there's some place that I'd rather be. Ah, who cares about us? Let's say something about the cast. Okay, cool. We're the Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast. We review, dissect, critique, and make fun of horror movies new and old. Sounds a little bit cliche, but I guess it's okay. Dave, why don't you tell them a little bit about some of our big shows, like the 40 Years of Horror, our Top 50 Slashers, even our classic format of pairing a new and an old movie together. Yeah, and how I have to edit like three, four hour shows twice a month just because we watch and review so damn much. Yeah, and how we do feature length reviews, shorter length, round robin reviews, top 20 topics, and a lot of fun interaction with listeners. That about covers it. All right, sounds good, guys. 
I knew we could do it. Tell the fine folks out there where to find us, Dave. Oh, yeah. Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast can be found on Horrorophilia.com, the Horrorophilia Network, LegionPodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and anywhere that fine podcasts are heard. All right, that's a wrap. Now, guys, tell me, what's the deal with this uh, porno? Are you the caboose or the engine? Them's the jokes, folks. <laughs> Hi, I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet... Earth. How peaceful it looks. Most effective, Your Majesty. We will destroy this Earth. Destroy it utterly. Send Rick and Danny in Wool Rocket Ajax. So, just destroy it? That's what Ming said. Don't you ever listen? Well, there's no arguing with Ming. Hail Ming. Wait! You see those transmissions on the visual screen? Crow? Nightmare on Elm Street? Chud 2? Black Belt Jones? Nightbreed? <laughs> What's a critter? Oh, I've seen those things. Flash? I guess we could wait a while before the destruction. Yeah, and watch the movies. And talk about them. The Hell Ming Power Hour. Disobedience to Ming. For now. You can find us at Legion Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. iTunes. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. At www. You know what? Just Google it for yourself. Just Google it, you bastages. Hell Ming. Breaking 2? Electric Boogaloo? Samurai Cop? Army of Darkness? Flash Dance? <laughs> <laughs> we might destroy the planet if it's flash dance. <laughs> <laughs>